let's start the show. For Thursday, October 12th, 2017, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Right. <laughs> Look at that fussy squirrel on my bird feeder. And then suddenly, the Enterprise D's bridge. <coughs> Excuse me, I wish we had a cough button on this. Welcome to this week's episode of The Zillion Test. I'm Norm. We're all back in studio. We have a quad cast this week. Uh-huh. Special quad cast for quad damage. Uh, that intro tells you that very special guest, Will Smith, is in the house. Hi, Norm. Will. Hi, Norm. I, I'm worried that I might have passed through ironic appreciation of bad dubstep just to appreciation of bad dubstep now. Hmm. <laughs> It was purely through that intro song, or just I, no, no, a dubstep no, no. I mean, just in general. Like every once in a while, when I'm listening to it, like, like a dub, somebody does a dubstep ad on a, like a car commercial or something, I'll be like, mm-hmm. "Yeah, that's a pretty good drop." I'm still not familiar enough with dubstep to distinguish between bad dubstep. And I, all dubstep is bad. Dubstep. Is, the, is the is step phase one? Wow. Okay. And B, it's the the quality of the drop. You need to not know when the drop hits, and the then it needs to hit you of like a ton drop. of bricks. Interesting. Yeah. They can overdo it though, right? They can keep returning I, to the drop, and it just gets a little repetitive. I kind of feel like you get one cha- chance at that's that how I first feel about drop. It. Let it hit. Yeah, yeah. You want to feel it. You want to feel it all the way through. Yeah, that's right. That of course is Jeremy Williams. How are you doing, Jeremy? I'm all right. How are you doing? And then at the far end of the table, good. Thank you for asking. <laughs> at the far end of the table, we have Kishore Hari. Well, I also want to ask how you are doing. I'm good. How are you doing? All right. All right. I, all I do well. like. The podcast there for a second, go, turning into white guys talk about EDM music. Yeah, well, it was pretty at, great. At one point, yes, it was yes. pretty great. Yeah, why for, did you, for thirty why, seconds there? Why are you guys at the ends of the table? That's what I want to know. Well, we're just surrounding you. Okay, that's good. We're, we're just showing you how you're slowly becoming irrelevant. Look, in this country. the minority. I right. mean. <laughs> I love I love Will trying to like parse. (laughs) What can I say here? I was I was gonna go. Well, the thing is, the thing I'm worried about is, like three years ago, I'd have made a joke. I'd been like, oh yeah, you know. But now there's nothing funny there. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's too real. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we're back in the office because we were gone last week. Sorry for skipping an episode, but we were gone the entire week in New York for the annual New York Comic Con. Ooh. It was a big convention. But like for the past, we've been working with Adam for five years now, and we've only done for the first four years, we only did just San Diego Comic Con. The, the original. The original. And now we're doing San Diego and New York, and mm. it's just as big, just as much planning, except it's all the way across the other side of the country. Was this your first time ever being there? No, my third time being there. Oh, okay. Uh, we went last year only for a day, and this year we're there. It was our first year being there like for the full time, yeah. every single day. Uh, got an Airbnb in Hell's Kitchen, um, and New oh. York's just wonderful. Did you see Daredevil? Uh, no, but Hell's Kitchen's very small. R- okay. restaurant, we never see Restaurant Row in Daredevil, the show. It's no. very interesting, yeah. Yeah, Hell's Kitchen's not very big. My city. My city. A lot of crime, though. I hear. I hear. Yeah. Did you see any, like, scary kingpin-looking guys? And, mm, no. 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 They, they're above, they live above the city. They look Cage's down bar? on the city. Ninjas with no heartbeat? I don't think. Uh, that's Harlem. Oh. Really? Did, I thought it was right around the corner. No. Because what's her name walks over there? She's super powered. I guess she's pretty fast. Yeah. She can jump over the buildings and stuff. Yeah. I understand you did a little cosplay yourself. I did. Um, so we were trying to figure out what cosplay to to do for Adam's Incognitos at New York. And uh, because at San Diego this year, we unveiled you know big uh, King Arthur armor from Excalibur. Um, and it's difficult to every year come up with like four or five new costumes to do. So this year we did something different. We did a duo Incognito with Adam as Chewbacca. He was Chewbacca also at San Diego this year. His very... Um, one of his favorite costumes ever and his favorite mask, I think, made by Tom Spina. And I went along with him as a First Order Stormtrooper. Uh, <laughs> Did you try to put the shackles on him? Uh, well, he put the shackles on himself. He made the shackles, yeah. actually. He, did that. He, said, he said it was his cheapest build he did so far. It was like less than 10 bucks in materials to make those shackles. Huh. Uh, and uh, we walked the floor. Um, I, I hear all your too short to be a Stormtrooper jokes. But this is all <laughs> relative. Think of it as special effects because it made Chewie that much taller. It made Chewie look great. And yeah. it, it, size worked out. Do you carry a gun? 
Uh, no, we didn't want to deal with um, any um, any policies, any uh, checking weapon in, check, weapon oh. check. Yeah. Did you get any gruff for like putting out your hand to tell people? Like you had the pose where you're sticking out yeah. the stormtrooper hand. I, it's something I didn't we, think about too much going into it. So the, the my stressing at a point, and even though we didn't, I didn't make the stormtrooper armor. I did this, had to do all the assembly and fitting of it, which is not easy to get to fit your body. Um, well, you like placing the the, the actual well, trimming, things on yeah. on all the part, so it fits on your arm, right, and stuff like that, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and a lot of it's like uh, you know putting on Velcro straps, putting on uh, a lot of snaps, using Chicago screws. There's a whole under body gasket section, and you know um, hot gluing stuff together and making sure. I mean, it, it didn't stay together the whole time. I had some like bicep parts that popped off halfway through, but you're swole. What can I you do? I yeah. didn't think about the performance aspect of it as much. I was like, I'm just going to walk with Adam. And then once I got on the floor and he was being stopped um, every 30 seconds and at some point just nonstop Raja photos, I'd think about what is the pose? And, and you know, is it, it's not a peace sign. It's not a thumbs up. It's, well, I chose the out of the way, move out of the way. Yeah. So yeah, it was still for the photos. You weren't actually telling people to get no, out of the way. No, and so I had to yeah. do the point at little kids and then do the <laughs> come over here. And then for the camera, no, no photos. Yeah. And put, putting an arm on our, uh, the kid's shoulder yeah. as if they were also being arrested. Did you talk to people through the mask? No, I couldn't couldn't say a thing. Okay. It was very difficult. And it was Could also tinted. It was very tinted. So the st- first order at New York Comic Con, one of the booths was Verizon had a Last Jedi exhibit mm-hmm. there, where they had costumes and helmets and props and uh, miniatures from the film. And so the, they had this wall of helmets and they had a first order stormtrooper helmet. And it really let me appreciate differences between um, a, something that was made for the film versus something that was made as a collector's item, which is like, Novos made this one. It's beautiful. It's very comfortable. But the eyes were uh, like tinted plastic, right? Very difficult to see. And the movie ones are actually this very fine, thin mesh. Oh, no kidding. Hmm. And so the whole thing looked lighter. So you can yeah. poke things through them if you, if you got in trouble. Like if uh, somebody came up to you with a, with like a pen, I, I, I guess that's so. bad news. That's bad. Very thin, like the, you know, the very small screen door. Wow. Yeah. Well, next year, you, could you see yourself going as a Stormtrooper again? Yeah, no, Never? it's such a versatile costume. Because if you want to put together like a voice synthesizer that gives you that voice, you know, the Stormtrooper. That's you the could, thing I You could have. just buy it from, buy one of those masks that hold, does it and rip it out and jam it yeah, in there. Yeah, that. and, and um, a lot of people in the RPF have kits that you can get. It's a pl- speaker placement is a thing. Mm. Uh, you want a way to activate it. But yeah, maybe I, I like that idea. I think Adam actually has one for his Kylo. But yeah, I helped him make one for Totoro. Mm, right, Ooh. right. So maybe next time. But I was also thinking of potentially going to Last Jedi in the armor. But then I realized this is not armor you could easily sit down in. You'd be all clinky. Yeah, and I could, I could barely go. Up, I couldn't go upstairs. I can't basically. see. Yeah, no, no. You take, you take off the helmet. <laughs> Do you have to go to the bathroom? I uh, no, 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 no. Okay. No. Did, huh? did, did not want to have to use the bathroom. Was your Airbnb near? No. Was it, no. So you had to like schlep your stormtrooper armor on the subway or in a lift or something? Uh, we, we walked. It was like a twenty minute walk, okay. and we walked with a big suitcase. Wow. Woof. Yeah, that's that's the cosplay life. But at least we had a room in the back room. I mean, the, the people running the convention were super nice and able to set us up with a nice private room with a locked door that we can leave our gear. Oh, in. for Adam to do the walk. Oh, exactly. Man, that's, exactly. That is huge. Yeah, yeah. So totally. you didn't have to stage out of an adjoining hotel, yeah. which I guess probably doesn't exist at Javits. There is no adjoining hotel. Everything is yeah. like you know a block or two away. Yeah, uh, it's not too far away from Times Square either. A ton of hotels there. But New York Comic Con, ton of stuff. Uh, if you've never been, we've been to San Diego, and tell you that it feels like s- f- uh, less booth space, not as much floor space, but there are just as many people there. And I actually like the fact that it's more catered to people who are to mingle and cosplay because it's the Javits Center is just an open box atrium almost um, with beautiful light and multiple tiers. So you have like on the ground floor a huge hall where people just hang out like and groups of cosplayers do like Game of Thrones cosplay or Star Wars cosplay and all get together and it's all inside all, all air conditioned too hmm. I I have a friend that works for Read Pop and he's one of the producers for New York Comic Con and uh, I think the part that uh, that he says he likes the most and, and I think um, Sane's the most interesting there seems to be a whole lot more like shows and performances and and get togethers in and around the convention like away from the conference center. Like, didn't Adam do a, a reading with Hodgman? He did. Um, he did uh, uh, the Plan Nine. 
Yeah, yeah, with, oh, uh, right. with Janet Varney. Yeah, that was a. Uh, I unfortunately didn't go, didn't get to go, but it was with um, John Hodgman, Travis McElroy, uh, I think Paul and Storm might have been there. Uh, but yeah, uh, apparently that was a lot, lot, a lot of evening events because it's right in the heart of New York, right? So well, like when the floor closes, like the first panel that Adam did with Neil deGrasse Tyson was after the floor closed, and then people rushed. Wait, why are we burying panel. the lead? Do you hang out with Neil deGrasse Tyson? I did not get to hang out with. I have to spend eight. 90 minutes is this, where, is this where LeVar Burton read him uh, Goodnight Moon? That was the same day. So LeVar Burton, I guess, did something with Audible and, um, and Neil deGrasse Tyson where he read him Goodnight Moon. I don't know the exact location. That might have been Hayden Planetarium or oh, something. Oh, that wasn't Comic-Con. It's all like in New York. They're Comic-Con all there for Jason. New York. You know, Got it. Yeah. What was weird is that was an Audible promotion for Andy Weir's book. Yeah. Yeah. And for, I had no idea what that Artemis. had to do with Artemis, but okay. Right. And he was giving away, like, he was giving away pre-releases on the floor if you caught what? Andy. What? Yeah. Are you serious? Oh. Yeah. Hard copies? Uh, yeah. I, I, so he said he had a back. I saw on Twitter that he said, find me on the floor and I'll, I have copies of the book. I almost don't believe Andy. you. What? I have his email. I'm just going to go email. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I didn't see, get to see him. Uh, yeah, Audible did a big promotion because Rosario Dawson is doing the reading for Artemis. I'm very excited about that. So Is the same person as The Martian? Uh, no, Ar- Rosario Dawson, uh, the actress. I don't know who that is. Have she you was watched in, Daredevil? She's a yeah. nurse. Oh, really? Yeah, she's she was in, in uh, Clerks, two. Clerks Two. Rent. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. Um, she's in a lot more than that. Come Rosario on, Sarah Dawson has been in a ton of stuff. Um, I think we named the top ones. <laughs> No, we missed something really obvious. <laughs> yeah, no, well, well, why don't you look that up? Uh, the other reason I love New York Comic Con as a convention is that um, it's less of the big studio booths. There are fewer of those and more of independent artists. And there's hmm. a whole area called The Block. And you have a lot of, like, New York has a big designer community. Um, so artists, graffiti artists, and vinyl toys, and custom sculptures, and uh, art prints. And so they all had booths there. And I got to mingle with, and chat with a, a bunch of my favorite artists. Seven Pounds, artists. Sin City. Sin City. The Lego Batman movie. Yes. Uh, she Men was, in Black 2. She was, the, the, uh, she was Barbara Gordon. I, oh, I still think Rent's mm-hmm. better than any of those movies. Rent. That's a big deal. You mean Rent the Broadway musical? No, yeah. The movie. Okay. She was in Death Proof. She was in, yeah, she was in Death Proof. That's the, that's the big Rosario Dawson one for me, probably. Um, Adventures of Pluto Nash. No. I can keep naming things. That's an Eddie Murphy joint. Yeah. That might be the last Eddie Murphy. Oh, no, he did Haunted Mash and after that. Wow. Uh, so I picked up a couple things on the floor. Adam mm-hmm. um, talked about doing – he did a second incognito where he got to do a very casual walk around. Uh, first for an incognito, he was not spotted. Did you so. – did I heard about that. Yeah. I just asked him, like, were you spotted? He says, like, for the first time in forever, he walked, he, he walked around the floor for an hour and he wasn't, mm-hmm. you know, accosted. Because yeah. he didn't have an intricate costume, I think. Yeah, right. exactly. It was a mask. And it was intentional because it was so he could actually enjoy the floor. And we geeked out about his, uh, his, cos, his uh, con hall afterward, it's things a, he bought. It's a phenomenal mask. That he wore. That's yeah. the thing, though. Like, it just wasn't yeah. a full body costume. He used to do that. Like, the first year we went, remember, we, we were walking th- out of Comic Con one day and saw somebody wearing a suit and a Rocketeer helmet. And we're like, oh, that looks like Adam's Rocketeer yeah, helmet. It was him. And then it was Adam. That's yeah. funny. He yeah. brings it. The were, casual walk around. Were there a sufficient number of mystery boxes? Oh, God. What are mystery boxes? <sighs> oh, no. <laughs> I specifically avoided that part of the retail section, uh, but there are definitely aisles of booths that sold mystery boxes. Did, are, are you talking about like things that you pay money for and you don't know what's in them, then you open yeah. it up no, and no, you no, find no. it out? So, yeah. the, and it you, may be cosmetic or it may wait, wait, the wait, progression wait. of your blind, game. Blind box is uh, a phenomenon in designer toy industry. Small boxes, you can buy them. Like You know, like you buy the South Park one or you buy the, 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 the this theme one um, and there's a collection of like, you know, 20 different ones, right? Yeah. 20 different characters. Like Lego blind packs. Yeah. This isn't that. This is like a box that's maybe a foot by a foot by a foot with it can be dressed up to look like a Mario coin or it could have some theming thing. And basically retailers throw in, quote unquote, $50 worth of value or whatever arbitrary large number value, MSRP, but they'll sell to you happily for 20, 25 bucks. And so, one, one of us at this table allowed one of their children to use their hard earned allowances to pay for such a device. You gotta teach him lessons the hard way. What you're buying is the mystery. This is like a sack of crap. I told it him. Is. 100%. I told him. I told him do do not open that box because the, it doesn't get better than this. The moment you open it, you will be disappointed. <laughs> and was, the, the did, mystery, how did it work out? He couldn't wait to open it, and he was disappointed. Oh. How much was it? Twenty bucks? Yeah, I think he bought like fifty dollars. That is a ton of money for yeah. a ten year old, twelve yes. year old. Yes. Wow, yeah. that's a hard lesson. Lesson learned. We will see. We don't let we don't, we don't let our daughter. I don't let her use the claw machine. Oh, God. 
Oh, but he's like, look, in the amount of time money you're going to spend getting this thing out of here, you could have bought three of them. Like heroin addicts at the claw game. Yeah, the oh. claw game is the worst. But it's so you're so close. No, it was so no. close. Well, just one the more. Just ring. one more time. It'll definitely be sometimes there. Sometimes we do the dad claw, where she gives me a dollar, and then I pick things up off the floor that could be hers, and then yeah. drop them at the last minute. It's good. And you ask for another dollar. Yeah, give me another dollar. You can try again. <laughs> That's great. Hey, you um, got to make money somehow. Because we were also there for quite a bit, uh, we found some opportunities to visit some off-site locations. So we went to uh, one of our favorite museums on the East Coast, the Museum of the Moving Image over in Queens. That's a fine museum. And they have a new permanent exhib- ex- exhibition on uh, Jim Henson with uh, the, I mean, you would love this whale. The puppets, all the many original puppets from mm. Henson, from the Muppets, from Sesame Street, from Dark Crystal, from Labyrinth, oh. from the, the, um, the uh, what's the, H- the HBO one, uh, Fraggle, Fraggle, Fraggle Rock. Fraggle Rock. Uh, they had the actual Muppet, the Muppet Show sign from the opener. <gasps> yeah. How big is it? It's it's like uh, I'm opening my arms out wide. It's like you know oh my God. four feet by six feet. Yeah. Oh my God! I get the concept, the sketches. Is it it's permanent? Permanent. Oh, so I gotta next go. time you're in New York, I'm totally this weekend. worth it. Come on, they had a Statler they had, Waldorf. They had, they had a Statler Waldorf. Yeah. They had a big bird. And the idea was that it was a history of not only the puppets, but also Jim Henson and Jim Henson Company. And so they have a lot of his early work, a lot of his conceptual, like, like the, commercial, like, like Ralph. Like their for counterculture com- stuff? A lot of the counterculture. They had a whole section area of his like weird experimental like films. The shit that they did in the East Village when they were all hopped up on goofballs. Yeah, yeah that's good. Uh, and and uh, uh, Miss Piggy, uh, Kermit, next to each of them, the, uh, each of the puppets, they also had, if they if were available, some of the contraptions and devices that the performers would wear underneath underneath a table or in the costume itself to be able to communicate and, and look at the screen. Like inside Big Bird, there's a tiny little CRT. No. Oh, so he can see out. So he, so Carol, so he can uh, see himself. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it turns out this is something we found huh. doing Foo stuff. It's really important that you're able to see yourself when you're performing a character. That, that was you the big can't, innovation. It's abstract. Yeah, because yeah. there was a big. Uh, huh. it was the big innovation was under the table. They would be able to see a, a monitor. You'd be a flip, but they would see the performance and then have this out of body experience yeah. of voicing and then and also puppeting. Did, did they go through how they did some of the stunts, like the like the bicycle riding? Yes, that is from, explained in the Muppet movie. Yeah, well, so they did it in the Muppet movie, and then they absolutely blew it out in like the flashback sequence in the Great Muppet Caper, mm. where Piggy is imagining her life with Kermit, and they're riding the bicycles by the creek, and there's like multiple people on bicycles. There's pe- there's humans. Yeah. There's puppets on bicycles. Is this the there's one trees the overhead? Yeah. It's in the park yeah. Yeah. in yeah. Great Muppet Caper. No, they showed um, that sequence for sure, and and. and Talk and the, about how and the Muppet, the, like the Muppet movie one is maybe maybe ten seconds. It's really short, mm. and and like it was clearly proof of concept for the second one. Oh, that's so good. There's a new documentary called Muppet Guys Talking. Yes, this is debuted at South by Southwest, and it's Frank Oz and um and, Dave Gold. Uh, Dave Gold. Yeah, uh, they're all this round table about. And send in. Did they show clips at the museum? Is it they for sale did there it. or anything like that? I don't think that's actually yeah. available. Yet. Okay, I'm kind of like, I I am reasonably sure that I've been in the presence of actual Muppet performers before and I'm always hesitant after especially after the behind the actor studio inside the actor studio with the Simpsons yeah like seeing the humans that make the voices completely messed up the Simpsons for me hmm. for a long time like I, I can watch the Simpsons again now but it, it was hard to separate you know Maggie Cartwright or um, uh, um, Lisa Lisa uh, God, what's her name um Nan- uh, Lisa is Nancy Cartwright. Nope. Nancy, Bart, no, is Nancy Bart, Cartwright. Is Bart is Nancy Cartwright. Lisa is. Oh my God! Halt, podcast halt. I'll let you, I'll let you think about this. Well, uh, uh, while we choices. continue, uh, and then uh, Adam had his own panel Yardley as well. Smith. Yardley, Yardley Smith. Yardley Smith. Right. I knew, yeah, a, a soap name. You, you guys have the same last name. I know. Of, of the Smiths. All Smiths look the same. And then uh, we unva- we launched actually over the weekend the uh, Terry English Armor series. So uh, premium members, you'll be getting that in a couple of weeks. But it's right now the time exclusive is on uh, ver vrv uh, slash tested, and you can watch the first couple episodes for free there. Um, any been- other questions about New York? You guys want to ping me? Where'd you before? eat? Norm? Yeah, what's, where'd what's you your eat? Food situation? Now, we had some crappy food. Uh, I don't want to. I, I, it's there's nothing there's, worth there's, mentioning. There's some bitterness. It's got crappy there's food. There's some bitter. We had some, okay. We had some nice burgers at a place called Five Napkin Burger in Hell's Kitchen. How many napkins did you use? I use I use exactly five. Wow. Intentionally, they had a they had a bratwurst burger. Wait, you went with Joey and you didn't eat well? Well, we went with we went with the entire tested team, and there was some division about oh, look boy. about where we could where we should eat. 
So, Joey's still mad at me for, for the time I made him have a burger in Switzerland. <laughs> you yeah. made him eat a burger in Switzerland? Uh, yeah. A really crappy American burger on our last day there. You should have you should have had some something with cheese and Gruyere and wine. And, oh, I know. I know. Good God. You didn't see any shows. Did not see any shows. I was hoping. So, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to go to The Void. Didn't have the t- opportunity to I'm gonna, visit I think I'm going to go out this weekend, so yeah, I'm excited. Madame Tussauds, right yeah. in Times Square. They have the Ghostbusters, which they announced last year, or they launched last year. It's expensive because it's 50 bucks because they bundle, they force you to bundle a ticket into the other shows. Hmm. Like, they have like a Marvel show and, and, of course, the Madame Tussauds Museum. And so you have to pay for all of that. I've heard good things about the Marvel show, too, though. Okay. For what so, it's worth. I mean, yeah, the, the time commitment to maximize yeah. your $50 buy-in. It's an afternoon. It, exactly. Uh, and then... Uh, um, well, we'll talk about Blade Runner maybe on the pop culture part. But uh, one last thing, flying back, mm-hmm. I flew Virgin America, which I know is going away soon because Alaska is taking it over. Yeah, They did not have go-go internet. They had a new oh, service. Yeah, we, we, if Viasat. you get a plane with one of the, if you get one of the new planes with the Viasat, it's eight bucks it, um, and it's like bad DSL, which is really good. Eight, eighteen dollars because oh, it's five hours. Flight, yeah. It's still cheaper than like the 30 or $40 for oh, go-go. Yeah. And I did a video call. Yeah, you can do... They don't block wow. that out. No, I you did can video, stream I video. Watched, I, I streamed PUBG yeah. watching, and then I did a video call from an airplane. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, the it video calls. It felt like the future. Yeah. So Norm throttled all of the other Norm passengers. Norm everybody else's in there. No, it's it's actually... So the Viasat is really... It's super high speed. They segment each user to like 1.5 or 3 megabits or something like that. Uh, you have very low upstream. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, it is it is... Infinitely that usable internet on the airplane, and it was cheap. Blew my mind. Blew how, do you, my mind. how do you know if you have a plane that has that or not? Uh, if, if you log into the Wi-Fi, it says go, go Wi-Fi. You don't have Don't it. pay money. <laughs> if it says Virgin, pay money. Is it only on Virgin? I'm sure no, other people have Viasat, too. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's American maybe has it, too. And so it's only on newer planes. They have to put it. You can also tell by looking at the plane because there's a thing on the top of the plane in the back that's the antenna really? for the satellite. Yeah. Okay. It's like a little radome kind of looking thing, a bump. You have a live show note? Oh, and uh, w- before we jump into the pop culture uh, news, uh, pop culture. a reminder that we are doing a lot of our lives, annual live stage show in San Francisco at the end of this month, uh, Oct- Saturday, October 28th, and it will be at the Castro Theater at 7 p.m. Tickets are on sale now. What's the website, Kishore? Tested2017.eventbrite.com. Hope or you can purchase a ticket on tested.com. Yeah, tickets are up there. All right. Do we want to start off with some Blade Runner? I it's, mean, it, it, it's good. Hopefully, if you uh, if you listen to this podcast, you also listen to Still Untitled. And this week, we did an over hour long podcast spoiler cast on Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Uh, not everyone here in this room, as of this recording, has seen. I it have yet. not seen this movie. There, are, there are there are non spoilers at the beginning of the Still Untitled I, you know, podcast. I've only seen it one point nine five times. Kishore fell asleep. What? What a fuck! Ch- <laughs> you fell asleep. To hopefully, the second time, not hey, the first. Hey, it time. was late. I've been up a, a while, and <laughs> it was late. late. Yeah, yeah, that's all uh, I have to that's, say. That's why I haven't seen it. I too have watched it twice because wow. the first time, well, get, I, Adam and Joey went to the premiere, and so when we got to New York on Wednesday, all they wanted to do was talk about Blade Runner. And I said, you guys cannot talk about Blade Runner. I haven't seen it yet. So I bought a ticket because we're busy in your Comic-Con for Friday night IMAX. I'm like, this is the, that's, I'll watch it. I can bear it. Thursday morning, they were already doing, like when we were getting ready for Incognito, they were oh, already Oh, you tried like, to make them wait from Sunday until Thursday to talk about Tuesday it? Tuesday was a premiere. Okay. Tuesday. Okay, so you tried Tuesday to make them wait from Wednesday until Friday. They were like whispering between themselves. Yeah. Like, we got to talk about this. So I, I can't wait. I can't wait one more day. Okay. So I watched it that night. Uh, Dolby and IMAX I'm telling you Dolby is the better experience hmm. if you can have a Dolby theater in uh, in your theater uh, do you want any impressions Jeremy do you want do you want what do you think I mean here's the deal I'm not I'm not the biggest Blade Runner fan I mean go figure I don't know I lo- love Harrison Ford I love sci-fi I love you know the yeah. 80s I just ne- Blade Runner never grabbed me when's the last time you watched it I'd probably eight seven or eight years ago I would recommend see that's tough because 
I really would encourage, I know Adam says you don't need to, and I don't think you absolutely need to. Yeah. I really would encourage you watch the first one. I was really I mean, glad I had just rewatched the first I've one. Seen it multiple Director's times. cut, too. Final the cut. Final cut. Final cut. Sorry. Unicorn. So you need the what unicorn. unicorn, yes. And agree. You're going to tell me some things. I'm going to learn things about the movie I've never. I didn't know going into it. Is it going to ruin Here's the experience for me? Am I good? No, we're not going to spoil anything. Right. We're going to tell you that it may it expands the universe without adding a bunch of unnecessary bullshit you don't need to know about. Okay, it makes the first. I think I think the sequel makes the first movie better. Okay. It's a series. It's it's definitely in the category of reboots, if you want to call them reboots, like refreshing nostalgia pieces where it, it takes the direct lineage. Whereas like the like just like the Force Awakens, where that was set thirty years after the original film, and you had the old actors come, and it's a continuation of the story in some ways. Uh, this is just like that. It's not a complete it's- revamp reboot. It is very much the original film set logically 30 years later. It feels like a Blade Runner movie, but visually, I think it stands apart. Yeah, it's not a Ridley Scott movie. It's yeah, a Denny exactly. Villeneuve movie. It's, it's very reminiscent of The Hustler and The Color of Money, like that relationship, because those movies are ostensibly sequels. The Hustler is Jackie Gleason and young Paul Newman, and then 20 years later, The Color of Money is old Paul Newman and very young Tom Cruise. And it's, it's it, the same film told in a different way about different characters but in the same world now uh the other one inv- piece of advice i would give because i hope you are going to watch this in theaters stay is, awake through the middle is use the bathroom beforehand it's long it's a long film the oh, yeah. second time i watched it i had to use the bathroom i took the, the longest pee of my life after it i like i i got up at the end of that movie and ran to the bathroom at the draft house it's almost three hours long yeah two hours and 40 and minutes add with with trailers. trailers in there it is yeah. over three hours yeah, so uh, I don't think there's too much more to say about the film. Well, I, w- I will say this. Like, uh, I know you're a big fan of Sicario, which is his it's other sort of movies, masterpiece yeah. works. Rival's good, too. In yeah, yeah, is, is How do you think this holds up as like a follow-up for Villeneuve? Um, I, I, I'm, he, he is definitely on the list of most interesting people working today. Like head and shoulders, we'll see how Ryan Johnson does with the next Star Wars, right? That's sure. that's that's the other like of the people who started working the last fifteen or so years and and have been making increasingly bigger budget films. Ryan Johnson is really really high on my list because like Looper and Brick and I guess that's it, right? For Ryan Johnson, but those are two spectacular films. Uh, Villeneuve's produced more in such a short period of time it's almost like when nolan was making the batman movies and then took a moment out to jam out inception and then rolled straight from there into interstellar like i, I can't wait to see what he does next i love it when he works with dennis uh, with uh, with roger deakins because mm-hmm. those movies are gorgeous like i think that's what was missing from arrival because uh he was on uh deakins was on uh hail caesar oh while arrival I was that. being shot i think I mean, they came out around the same time, so I assume so. If you, I think, if you haven't watched Sicario, it's really great oh. introduction to his his work and his landscape. So when you get to parts of Blade Runner, you can see it really come through. Um, we, I think Sicario, I still liked it a little bit more than this Blade Runner follow through, but it's still this is an incredible movie. So, so I've only seen I saw Blade Runner once so far. I'm going to go see it again before it's out of theaters because I think I think there's it's visually rich in a way that it won't that won't transfer to to um, home as well. <laughs> um, but I, I I don't like I really enjoyed the movie. I think it's a fantastic follow up to Blade Runner, which is a, a flawed film in a lot of ways. Um, I, I don't I don't. I, I haven't rendered my final judgment on this film yet. I really liked it. I think I, everybody should go see it. I think it's definitely worth watching. It, it is like one, it is a movie that makes you work, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it, like, you have to think during mm-hmm. this movie. Or, it, or dream. And <laughs> Well, but when we were talking, when we were talking this morning on Still Untitled about um, our different interpretations, Adam's seen the movie three or four times now, three times. Three times, yeah. have seen it a couple of times, Norm, I've seen it once. It was very clear that Norm and Adam had gotten stuff from repeated viewings that I did not catch the first time. Huh. Because there's a lot of plot, there's a lot of character, and a lot of the other stuff you don't kind of, if you're paying attention to that, it's difficult to, to suss out the other stuff. So. Norm, Norm, I find you to have a frightening um, ability to predict movies. And did you predict the ending to this? Did I didn't s- predict the beginning. This is a movie, and we can talk a little about the marketing campaign. Campaign because we hadn't didn't talk about it and still untitled. But Alcon, who uh, so this was produced by Alcon and distributed by Warner Brothers, Sony, and uh, uh, Columbia TriStar, 
and uh, they were apparently the marketing was Alcon was in charge of the marketing. They specifically designed trailers to bring back some nostalgia, show you that Harrison Ford was in it, but not give away. 80% of what actually goes on in the film. So we left in the dark. But I would also recommend that some, something happened with the last trailer. The last trailer is terrible. It actually gives away big, like gives away appearances, gives is away. Is that the one with all the voices where they cut them all together yeah. in different ways? Yeah, so yeah. don't watch this last trailer. But And I don't think the prequels, they did three short film prequels. Don't watch You this. don't need those either. Um, they were fun to watch afterward. I think the movie is so well written and so it stays one step ahead of the viewer. Now hmm. you could guess things that are going to happen in the movie as you kid because there are some you know some old tropes that maybe are played, but if you watch Blade Runner and you you're at the end you had questions about whether Deckard's a replicant, like and that was your big question about the film, uh, that's not what this film is about. That's true because that was the question a lot of people had going into it. Yeah. That, 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 it's, this film isn't about answering that question. Interesting. No. It, is a, expan- it expands a question that came up in Blade Runner, though, I would say. Yeah. And it expands a lot of the themes of Blade Runner without without coming through and saying, this is what this is about. This is right. Which is what my fear was. Like, like making a Blade Runner sequel in 2017 could be, hey, I'm Bob Deckard, replicant, and uh, welcome to my private, intel- my, my private investigation agency. And yeah, we he'd don't be, get any he'd of that. be Bobby Deckard. I, I, the other thing that's surprising about this movie, as good as it was, it is done horribly at the box office. It nope. is really tame. I mean, it's a long, thinky science fiction movie. How did that work out for Arrival? Did okay, right? But only in like over I mean, the long run. This only had like a thirty-five million dollar opening weekend, which thirty-one is, million dollar. Ugh. Wow. I think I, I mean, made less than Alien Covenant so the, opening weekend. The thing I read is that um, so. One Max Landis had on Twitter the other day a thread about why um, about what he thought were the problems with the trailers, um, meaning that the trailer didn't explain to you at all what movie you were going to go see. So if you yeah. didn't already love Blade Runner, you were going to watch that trailer. If you love Blade Runner, you're going to watch that trailer. And be like, fuck yeah, I'm going to go watch a Blade Runner movie. If you don't know what Blade Runner is, or you watch Blade Runner in college and don't give a fuck about it now because it didn't stick with you, as I would assume probably happened to most people who watch Blade Runner, you, you, like like you're not going to watch that trailer and be like, I should go watch that. And if you compare and contrast that with say the Mad Max Fury Road initial trailer, not the teaser, but the first trailer that has striking visuals in the same kind of way that, that this trailer did. But the Mad Max trailer basically says, look, here's the story. The world's ended. Everybody needs gas. Everybody needs water. Some shit's going to go down and Max is in the middle of it. Like it's, it's the same thing. They're rebooting a 30 year old movie and the Mad Max trailers are really good advertisements for what that movie was, and the Blade Runner one is just a bunch of really cool stuff. I think I think Max nailed it. Actually, that's, what I'm, that's the long way of saying what I was um, saying. Yeah, I mean, and something they could have done is just laid out what replicants are. You know, that they live like what the world set up the world set up that. I the the movie opens. It's not a big spoiler. I say the movie opens up with some some text. Um, and that, oh, kind of a lot of text. Yeah, and that text could have been in the form of a trailer. To I mean, the the trailers could have used the information that was provided in that text to set up that world because the text is compelling. Yeah. Did the short films not do that? They don't. The yeah. short films are more backstories of individual characters. I didn't watch the short films before the movie, and I didn't feel feel like I missed anything. No, but afterwards, I do think they fill in. It's nice. They're yeah. good, especially the the cowboy the the anime one was done by a cowboy. I, I've seen that one. I haven't seen the other two. I actually like the um, uh, the Dave Bautista one. Huh. As filling in a lot more about him. Um, okay, so that's a, a lot of a lot of talking around Blade Runner. Uh, Let's keep talking around movies. Go, go watch Blade Runner, please. <laughs> uh, I want thing, more movies in Blade Runner. Blade, uh, go yes. watch Blade Runner. It doesn't need to be a sequel to Blade Runner either. I just no. want more movies that are made with that kind of love and that kind of boldness and. Uh, that kind of trust in the audience. I've, I've got one. I've got an idea for you. It's Blade Runner meets Alien. Meets Predator? No, no. Predator comes later. Okay. <laughs> but right. but it's it's Waylon Yutani. Waylon. Mr. I guess it's Yutani because we already know who Waylon is. Mm-hmm. Mr. Yutani, Mr. Mr. Yutani, Mr. Yutani, Mr. Tyrell, Mr. Wallace. Yeah, and Mr. Wallace all go out and it's like weekend at Bernie's except for uh, Tyrell and Waylon are both dead. Mm. Got but, it. Okay. Uh so, uh, speaking of trailers, mm. uh, we had a big trailer release uh, two couple days ago now, as uh, yesterday when mm-hmm. we're recording this. The Last Jedi's second trailer is out. 
final trailer. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I guess yeah. we're only two trailers. Big theatrical trailer. I'm sure we'll be seeing it in front of Thor Ragnarok. I have not watched it. God, is Thor? When does Thor Ragnarok come November out? November third. Three weeks from now. That's three weeks from now. Just now. I I watched the trailer. And you know what? I watched it looking for one thing, and I got it. You got some sweet porgs? Porgs, baby. You know, I just find it weird. Porg singular. People know what porgs are at this point. Yeah. Well. A little strange. I mean, porgs, baby. We'll I, get that, like, I, that story. I get that there's merchandise, but the fact that people have already decided that they're interesting. Two weeks ago, I watched you put together a porg minifig. It's canon. <laughs> it's, man. So, it's so true. It's so true. You assembled a porg? Minifig. Ooh. It was for part of the Millennium oh, Falcon. Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Yeah. Like I didn't Falcon see the doll. board. So I feel like I don't need to see the trailer because... You don't. It, I but don't. You know that they're good about these, right? You can watch these Star Wars trailers and it won't be spoiled for but, you. Right, I right, can tell you what's going to happen in the movie right uh, now. No, 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 I know no, no, the whole thing. Like I know they're good about... Uh, they're smart enough. Disney is smart enough to make a trailer to not spoil the, some big plot points. Yeah. It's not going to be like an Empire Strikes Back trailer where they reveal the Luke's father, right? What? The it's not, there was, I'm saying Wait, it's what? not going to be in that vein. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like, Spoiler, where, as, if, as if they made an Empire trailer. Had and, they done that. Had they done that. Yeah, it's not going to be that. This is supposed to be the Empire of this trilogy. Yeah. But... The way you watch a trailer, mm -hmm. the way I watch trailer, is that the visual imagery sticks with me so much that I'm going to be waiting for those shots in the film. So yeah. as I'm watching the film... Hey, you do that with Rogue I'm, One, you're disappointed because you don't see half those that's, shots. That's another right. thing. You think the movie's like, where's that shot? The movie's not over yet. And suddenly it's over. I'm like, that's, that was really weird. Yeah. Where are those shots? Where's the TIE fighter coming up to see uh, Jyn Erso? Uh, I don't want that feeling. I hate that feeling of being in the theater waiting for the see the shots of the trailer, making a checklist. Yeah, How you. are you going to avoid the trailer, though? Joey does it somehow. Right. Yeah, I, I, I've been avoiding trailers. I watched it's Blade easy. Runner. See, he watched it a second time. But when you York, go see other he, movies head and it down, comes on, head down, ears closed. This is all I, I will say after watching the trailer, I don't think I should have watched the trailer. Oh, like, why? like I, it, like I didn't love it. It yeah. didn't. I felt like it. It told me too much. Even though, it, like, I agree with Norm, Disney probably didn't tell me a whole lot. Uh huh. But it told me stuff that I didn't want to see. It, it made me ask questions. I think that they edit these trailers very well, and they edit them in a way that is misleading, mm -hmm. so that you think you see things that you're not seeing. Yeah, they, they, I think they're do, playing seven-dimensional chess. They'll do shots where you got a character and do a cr over the shoulder yeah. shot where and, you think it's a cross shot, but it's not. And you hear somebody's voice, and you're like, "Oh, that's this person," and it probably yeah. won't be. You yeah, know? yeah. So I, I enjoyed it. I liked hearing Luke talk for the first time, and oh, who knows he how talks long. Talks in the film. <laughs> He Come actually has a, the trailer for Force Awakens. He actually his voice is a little tweener between old school Mark Hamill and the Joker Mark Hamill. Interesting, interesting. Well, he's yeah. probably been out there by himself all that time with the Porgs, just talking to himself, being like, "Hey, I used to be a Jedi." You know, <laughs> no. I don't know. They, they made me ask some questions I haven't asked yet about the film, and I'm happy to have those be That's questions what I right don't now. Want. I don't want those questions. I don't, I don't want to be thinking. Avoid. I don't mm -hmm. have those percolating. We can I mean, all agree that the poster is really good, uh, though, right? Yeah, I like the poster. Yeah, it's fine. There were even even with Blade Runner, and Blade Runner made me appreciate going into it relatively cold. Like even the people who saw it early, there were some ambiguous tweets that they weren't spoilers in the tweets themselves, but they provoked things in my head mm. that got me thinking. Like everything is kind of a spoiler if, if it makes you think about a, the movie in a certain direction, even if it points you in that yeah, general direction. Yeah, if it frames your thoughts about a film, yeah. then you're spoiling the, my it. My thing That's is the objection to spoilers. My, well, after this, what was it? What, there was some sporting event. Is that, am I correct in assuming that? Football. Was it a basketball Monday night game? Football. It was a oh, football, football game. Okay. That's, yes, that's the egg-shaped ball. Pointy mm -hmm. one. Well, <laughs> you're a horrible nerd, Jeremy. They, um, when after that hit and the trailer went up, like you couldn't avoid it. It what like what, for whatever reason, my Twitter feed was pretty restrained when it came to Blade Runner. So I, I, I still haven't had that spoiled for me. Forget it. With the Star Wars trailer, it's all over the place. Oh, see, I just don't you, want to use Twitter anymore. You just can't avoid it. But can you avoid you it can anywhere? Mute, you can mute Star Wars. I didn't. I literally, I have not. I was, I, after the trailer, yeah. I went and had dinner and tucked in my kid. Yeah. And then I went and played PUBG until it was time to go to bed. Mm. And then I woke up this morning and came here. So it's been no problem for me. For, well, for me, I just didn't want to deal with it. So I just watched it. You don't want the headache, the anxiety? No, whatever. Yeah, it's two months. It's going it, to come it, out. It's Star Wars every year now, man. It's like... You, for the rest of our lives. you got to give it up. you just got to say, all right, let's watch the trailer. It's, You're only going to get a, your first Ryan Johnson Star Wars. That's right. One that's, time. Well, yeah, it's true. Did you watch the first trailer? I did. Yeah, then yeah. be happy there. Yeah, what, would, exactly. what, would you do, what would you do to go back and see Empire Strikes Back cold again? Like, would you wipe out all the other memories from 1981 if you were born, mm, in, 1981? born in 1981? I know you were not born Wait, in 1981. Wait, was that like a super clever carbonite joke? 
to what? watch it cold. Oh, yeah, that was pretty amazing. That was, uh, that yeah, was totally pretty there. Yeah. amazing. I meant to do that, but but you were Jeremy. You and Control were like, I would, I knew what happened in Empire because of because I saw I saw the movies out of order because I was six years old. I didn't Is that know the what greatest the fuck twist and the greatest reveal in film film history? Pop culture, you, Kaiser Soze. It was, club. For me, it was the greatest reveal in elementary school because I didn't get it revealed in, in the theater. Yeah, I, I like I knew exactly. I knew that Darth Vader was Luke's father. People talked from about Return it. of the Jedi because, oh. before I saw Empire. Oh, okay. Um. So yeah, like I would, I would literally do. I would probably wipe out all of 1981 <laughs> to be able to go wow. back. <laughs> it's a lot of will and, and I was six and, years old, but nothing important happened. I only remember some of that stuff anyway. So, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Norm, I give you, I give you. One month before you've seen this trailer, uh, forcibly. You're gonna because have, you're gonna go to movie theaters. You're gonna just watch it. it Reserve seats. It's not gonna up late. Yeah, you're gonna get see a text. It. Get, get a text from the wife don't, inside. Trailers are over. Don't. Speaking of trailers, before I move on to the next subject, uh, one trailer that I guess this is interesting. Uh, ahead of Blade Runner, there was a trailer for Ready Player One. A mm-hmm. new one. It's what? a new trailer for Ready Player One. Like. But it was 80% the same visuals uh-huh. as the first trailer, except they changed the soundtrack up. It's not Rush anymore. It's not uh, Paul, uh, Tom Sawyer? Tom That's Sawyer. an improvement already. It, it, yeah, it changed the entire tone of it. No. And the first trailer, way better. So I, I thought this was really interesting. I think there was a lot of um, marketing, maybe... Um, uh, the, Maybe backlash against the first trailer because of a lot of the subtitling, no you know, shit. Ernie Klein's holy grail of pop culture. Yeah. And so you change that up too. But structurally, it's exactly the same huh. as the first trailer. Added a few more shots, but long, extended the shots. The whole second half is like a music video to Tom Sawyer. How do they change the music? No, it was still in there. The, Tom Sawyer's in there, part, but it's but less, oh, less present. Yeah. Less present. Oh, okay. And the first half is a, is a new version of um, the pure imagination so oh, from uh, that's more overt. You can actually hear it. You can now. He, you can hear it. Yeah, that's interesting. Pure, the from Willy Wonka, Wonka one. Yes, mm-hmm. like a modern pop. Did you know that version of Pure Imagination? I, seen this, I don't watch trailers anymore, so I haven't seen this one either. <laughs> really? So the other thing is they changed the uh, that that line. Uh, you know, Ernie Klein's Holy Grail of pop culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's um, Ernie Klein's like uh, pop culture odyssey, which I think actually fits. That's as actually a descriptor. accurate. Yeah, it describes the plot of the film more. Wow. The first trailer is still better. Taking Rush away always makes things better. What? Yeah, that's my no. Feeling. Why are you hitting <laughs> on Rush? Rush is... Because Rush sucks. It was, it's <laughs> Canadian Thanksgiving this week. I can't oh, believe I it. I love Canadians. I love Thanksgiving. They're the Fuck Holy Rush. Trinity in Canada. How do you possibly... No, Brian Adams is the Holy Trinity. <laughs> Brian Adams, Mike Myers, and Justin Trudeau are the Holy Trinity. <gasps> oh, my God. Okay. I got you. Uh, can we get Can we get an uh, Inception sound? Okay. Do, do, do. I, I think we have to switch that over to the Blade Runner Womp. Oh. Blade Runner Womp was pretty good. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about when we were talking about New York Comic Con, and I was I was waiting for this. Uh, I gotta thank um, one of our tested listeners, uh, Don is his name. Uh, I don't know if one of the, Don. Thank you, because he got me into Don Lee. Uh, he got me into the Westworld experience. I didn't bring that. God damn it! I did the the Westworld experience in New York. What's, so, what's sex with a robot? Your wife would probably be pretty upset. <laughs> did you murder robot, anyone? Robots didn't exist. Don't exi- uh, so they did an activation where <laughs> they... Uh, oh, an activation, eh? An activation. You've clearly right. been talking to the marketing department. <laughs> where uh, the people had to find a secret location, and then they made a booked appointments to visit Delos, the, the company that runs Westworld, uh-huh. the Westworld show. And uh, Don, uh, he sent me a DM, and he had an appointment, so I was his plus one. And we got to go, and it's maybe like a half-hour experience where you go inside a, a building, Mark Delos, in New York, not at the convention. So yeah, you have to find yeah. it like a couple blocks away, find it, walk in, and you get into a lobby, and from the next half hour, you are basically in the Westworld onboarding universe. So it's like a, they decked out like this whole area to look like the, um, the white hat, black hat selection area. So you had all the guns on, on a table. It's like an Apple store. Yeah. That actors who were basically host, wearing the host clothing. And so the first gentleman was there. They talked very like robot-like, welcomed us there. And they were blocking. The blocking of where they stood and their scripting had it so that they were standing exactly where this weird like soft light was on their face. So it looked like they were very ethereal, like movie lit robots. And you could ask them questions and they were all in character. 
Mm-hmm. And then so they had us like look Did at the guns, the props. You? No, okay. guns, props. You know, and then you and then we walked into a separate room. They let us there, uh, and they play like a trailer, like a video of Westworld, basically like a tour video. Then we walked into a room where I got to sit in a chair and a host did a survey on me. And so I actually have a photo of this I wanted to share. Did, oh. did, did you stay with the person who brought you? Yeah, so okay. it was like pairs of two. Okay. But only one person got to do the, the interview and Don let me do the interview. So I was very uh, uh, very grateful for that. So, so here's a photo and I'm okay. sitting there and then this woman who's a host, very scripted, Ask me a series of questions, like scenarios. So it was almost like a, a void comp test. Like, yeah. what would you do? You in come this across set? a tortoise in the it, desert, it, it's upside exactly. down. It's what do you one do? Of those. You have yeah. a button to push to kill half the people on the earth. And after that, she like en- enters information, and it was all perfectly scripted, perfectly acted, like very like eerie. In was it uncomfortable it for was you? Very, because uh, intense eye contact. Yeah. Right? Um, and like, int- like interesting response and that kind of like thing. And then after. The, the Q&A is over. She walks and she grabs a hat off the wall mm-hmm. and gives you a white hat or a black hat. Black so, hat. Ooh. White hat. It's a sorting, oh. a white hat. sorting hat. It's so, a white hat. So after that, you get to go to Westworld. Did Don get a hat too? No. It's just I got a hat. Oh, man. I know. So what do you mean you got to go to Westworld? So they take you to an elevator to the penthouse. Okay. Uh-huh. And you go up and when you exit the elevator, it's saloon doors and you're in a bar. What? You're in a bar. Wow. Was Tandy Newton there? No, but, but they had, so they had four. The piano uh, player thing? They had a player piano. <gasps> it was playing, and at some point. Was it playing pop music? It was playing, it, it, Black Hole Sun. Oh my God. And then <laughs> Blood started going. Oh, wow. That's wow. amazing. And so you're there for about maybe, it felt like 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, four bartenders behind, and they make you a series of four drinks. So you actually, it's 21 and over. They actually mm. make you really nice drinks. But then you can like the bartenders will describe what they're making, mm-hmm. and like if you didn't do anything, you would just like you would get the drinks and you had nice drinks. Uh, but they had like hosts also just sitting there, like there was a, a cocktail table and a woman was sitting there slowly drinking the whole time, and a woman was sitting at the edge of the bar just drinking, um, and it was up to you to interact with them. Mm-hmm. So uh, as a listener to the podcast, Don had heard us talk about the speakeasy, and, and, and he wanted to see what my thoughts were compared to that. And I'll tell you, this was not like the speakeasy, because while there were some scripted segments, like the bartenders would say, this, for our second drink, we'll have this, yeah. and, and make this cocktail, and, and put like a giant you know, flame thing. Uh, it was up to you to interact, so to engage, you were, be proactive. Did they ever overly encourage you to interact, or you just had to figure no, that out? No, you had to figure that out. So if somebody so, just sat there, they would have just let them sit there, you think? Yeah, if, if people, I mean, if they, it was groups of five. So if those five people were just there, like, and like the three of the five people were wearing white hat, black hats, uh, if, there was, if they just went with drinks, they could go through that entire experience with zero interaction. So while the speakeasy the has moments of improvisation, mm-hmm. it sounds like the Westworld experience is much more, Most, more that way. Yeah. And so I went oh. up to, I, I, it took me like five minutes to realize that these people are, no one's interacting with them. So I'm like, it's kind of weird too, because you know that in real life they're just, Human they're actors, they're people, but they're playing hosts. Right. So I went up to one and said, oh, what's your story? And she's like, I'm the madame. And I welcome to Sweetwater. Oh. And I'm like, and I said, oh, what's there to do around here? And then she would said, uh, lot, lots to do around here. Are you looking for uh, treasure? And then she stopped. And I realized that she was waiting for my response. <laughs> and so I said, are you looking for treasure? And then her face went blank. It was like an NPC quest. Wow. And I said, you're playing Zork. No, no treasure. And she said, how about trouble? And then I said, yeah, trouble. And then she goes, oh, yeah. You can, and, and then and I said, how do you find a gun? And he, goes, and he goes, well, you can buy a gun. You can buy a horse. Like, they, they had a whole, like, all these scripted wow. lines. Like, how long have you been here, Sweater? As long as I can remember. And, and so it was fascinating. Wow. Um, and then amazing. someone definitely, once people in that group realized you could interact with them, they tried, like, to, to poke holes in it, right? Like, what's that over there on that piano? Like, and they it listed the, you know, I don't see anything here. Yeah. Response. Uh, when the blood came up, um, and then at some point, of course, because it was like a very touristy thing, like a like an activation thing, they want people to take pictures, right? Like people, were, I had my DSLR. Get that on your Instagram, right? Exactly. It was very dark too. So, but people had like their iPads and they were taking pictures of all things. Oh. But uh, one of the hosts, like, um, uh, if if anyone would like a, a photograph, I could take help take a photograph, which was like kind of breaking the reality because you know photographs and cameras. Like, how would a robot host know? But I guess if you're in Westworld. Why don't they Technology just blink work. and use it with their eyeball? Exactly. So I said, could you help take a picture? And I gave her the DSLR. Mm-hmm. And this is my, 
the best part, she she took a picture, took like pressed it a couple times, and then she stopped. I'm like, what's going on? And I realized all the hosts had frozen <laughs> because it was the end of the experience and security guards came in. So we have an emergency. Everyone follow me. Everyone, c- come on oh, this that's way. Amazing. But it, that happened right when she was holding the camera. <laughs> and so she was just frozen holding my DSLR. And it really took me a second. Like, I, I thought she was like reviewing the photo. Yeah. <laughs> but she was just like frozen. Wow. And the security guard grabbed my camera out of her hands and gave it to me as we left. Wow. But, uh, that was it. Was really cool. So, so I did a, a Westworld themed knockoff escape room the last time I was in LA with some friends, and they had people, humans playing hosts of all varieties, like the bad guy, the good guy, the town, you know, the working people. Um, and I found it incredibly discomforting to talk to people who were pretending to be robots. Yeah, like it was yeah. really. Like I'm usually okay in those improv-y kind of escape room whatever situations, and it was really, really, like especially to play, especially when you're talking to women who was playing the forward, you know, the forward town prostitute roles, it, and and they like they were doing a good job, but it was very, um, I don't know, it was just it, it, it bypassed normal social norms in a way that left me very uncomfortable. It's a reverse Turing machine, isn't it? Kind of, yeah. yeah you don't want them to break. You don't want to. You want to push just to the edge of their script so that you can see how clever they were in the planning, but not put them in an awkward position. I mean, that's the thing is you don't want to – I didn't want to leave the performer in a place where they were going to – where they were having – where they were either uncomfortable or were having a hard time. Right. And then some people just blew right through that, and that was much, much worse. Yeah. At the thing we were at, at least. Right. I don't know. And, it was and weird. they definitely had – like the way it was set up, there were like security guards dressed as like Delo security, but really I think security for – the performer was just both. in case. Yeah. Uh, and they were just standing like arms folded, looking like uh, railings and yeah. So That's really cool. It was, oh, it was super, super cool. And I, and I got a neat hat from it. It how says many, Westworld inside. How many people? Oh, they gave you the, uh, I got to keep the hat. I wore it on the airplane. Uh, I don't know how many, I, I think it was very limited. If they were doing like five every half hour, right? And so, they did it for eight or 10 hours yeah, a day probably. a couple hundred. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. That's what the HBO money buys you. I know, right? Uh, okay, sorry to, Derail the conversation. Oh, do I have uh, to play that music again? Hmm. <laughs> um, you know, Kishore, you're talking about how uh, Mark Hamill in the Last Jedi, Last Jedi trailer sounded a little bit like the Joker, and uh, the the Joker from Batman the Animated Series. Well, he wasn't at New York Comic Con for that panel, but there was a panel for Batman the Animated Series and Kevin Conroy and Bruce Tim. 30th anniversary, right? Uh, is, yes. is it that 30? 30. You're joking. Mm-mm. No way. 90, 20, 93? That's 25th. Oh, 25th. Sorry. 25th anniversary. Uh, that doesn't make him feel much better, does Math it? Math is hard. A lot of screen on yeah. that phone. For the 25th anniversary of Batman Animated Series, they are going to be release, releasing a remastered Blu-ray set. This is this is the real gothic one with the blue and gray post-1989 yep. Batman? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And uh, Voltra actually has a really good uh, oral history of how that show got made. Because the people, Bruce Tim was working in... in um, uh, on Tiny Toon Adventures for Steven Spielberg at the time, and then they all got pulled off from f- to work at Fox <laughs> for this. Tiny Toon uh, was great too. Yeah, no, totally. And it was the, one of the first cartoons to, you know, standard practices basically had to fight with them every week because it was a dark series. When it was it on was Fox themes. at like two o'clock in the afternoon where I lived, I don't yeah. know if that was everywhere, but it was for like, me. It was on at, at five, but yeah, same idea that it was it was on really early and. It's only on Amazon Prime right now in terms of the streaming services, and it's mm. sort of buried. Right. It's hard to find. So I'm excited that this Blu-ray is coming out because some of those episodes are some of the best 20 minutes of animation out there. Heart of Ice. Heart of Ice, of course. I Heart think of Ice almost probably, got a number two. Yeah. Heart of Ice is probably the most notable episode. Um, this is the reimagining of Mr. Freeze as we know him now with his oh. wife, Nora, and being um, – and it's actually the, the catalyst for the Mr. Freeze characterization in Batman and Robin – Although I think they botched that. They botched it. I don't think we should talk about that. Uh, it was also the introduction of Harley Quinn in that series. Harley Quinn as a character was never in the comic books. It was really? introduced only Paul in Denny Batman. Paul Harley Denny. Quinn yep. for Batman huh. the Animated Series. And he did that because of the, the voice actress he knew that he brought the play played a Harley Quinn type character in a daytime soap opera. Uh, and then uh, my favorite episode, though, probably is the one where they create a robot Batman who doesn't know he's a robot. That's very you. That's, that you would yeah. that up. 
I thought it would be Beware the Grey Ghost. Beware the Grey Ghost is probably the best episode. It's 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 the one where Bat, you find out Batman had a hero. That Batman, uh, Bruce Wayne as a child read comic books or watched serial TV, serialized uh, dr- uh, crime dramas, and his hero was the Grey Ghost, who was uh, like a Batman type character, but voiced in the show by Adam West. Oh, that's good. Adam West was Batman's yeah. own superhero. Batman's are own they, hero. Are are there comic books in the DC universe? Yeah. Oh yeah. They they don't do pull a Logan though. Oh, where they make it? Yeah. yeah. I thought that was okay. You really grew, grew up with this cartoon as one yeah. of your childhood cartoons, I Absolutely. imagine, right? I mean, yeah. how lucky were you to have this? When, it, like, yeah. We had, we had, we had Looney Tunes. Do. Yeah. Looney, no, hold on. Well, I'm just saying. Like, I don't want to hear you talking bad about Looney Tunes. It's just you know, basically like slapstick vaudeville stuff. You know, we grew Jeremy up Jeremy Williams. Tom and Jerry gets rough around the edges, though. Tom and Jerry has problems. Yeah, speaking of spots, uh, the vaudeville slapstick stuff, are you guys playing Cuphead? Yeah. Yes. Cuphead is, uh, so for those of you who don't know, it's a game in development for a long time, released uh, a couple weeks Four ago, or five years, yeah. Xbox and uh, PC. PC, and it is a side-scroller up to two players. Uh, I would describe it as Contra in terms of its gameplay. <laughs> oh, God. But it, no, you, it's, it's, a, not, it's, it's, it's one single player, though. Right? No, two player. You, you can, can play, play Cuphead two player? Yeah, yeah. this I whole time. Player. I play play with my wife. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It yeah. makes it a lot easier, actually, because yeah. you can get the other person you can back save up. Them. Oh, there you go. See, that's yeah. the secret. It's you hard. Parry it. It's a, it's hard, a game. hard game. It's, it's a, I would say it's stylized like Contra in terms of you're firing a lot. And it's not like Mario. You're not stomping. Uh, but uh, the, the visuals are a pre standardized practices like old propaganda cartoon. It's amazing, and it is. Oh, it's not. No, it's it's like a Fleischer, uh, Fleischer uh, but cartoon. But way more subversive. I no, I don't think it's like my, Max Fleischer's cartoons. They, they were they were subversive. In a, I mean, maybe not quite at this level, right. cranked up to the twenty first century Max. But yeah, um, it's 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 kind of like a platform with some bullet hell elements. They're, like there's a lot of like dodging, learning patterns, and dodging and stuff yeah. like that. Parry. Um, the parry is important, especially for some of the bosses. It's phenomenally difficult if you're playing it with one person. Yeah, yeah. It's a unique game. It is a. It is. The art is lovely to in a way that we don't see often. It's. Uh, it was made by a couple of brothers, um, Chad and Jared Moldenhauer. Um, and there's, yeah, there's always a scratchiness on the screen, even during the loading screens, and the, and the soundtrack. Oh, yeah. The soundtrack is always like a record. Yeah, I love the cutscenes. Yeah, the cutscenes. Yeah, I love the Just voices. Wonderful. The voices. Totally worth it. Check it out. Uh, it's a game I wish was on Switch. That's I'm sure it will be soon. Because so I play, bed. I can play it in bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on the go, and I think it'd look great on a small screen. What else is on Switch? What's on Switch? Steam World Dig Two. I don't know what that game is. <gasps> Have you ever just wanted to dig a hole and see how far you can go? Like Minecraft? Man, no, Minecraft. You eventually hit the bottom of the world. Yeah. Um, okay. It's like that. Like, but but you could just keep it's a two D platformer where you dig down. You there's a story you have to um, solve puzzle dungeons stuff like that. Beat bosses, um, mine elements, and then sell them back and upgrade and level. It's basically level progression with the digging mechanic. It's really nice. It's a charming it, game. Is it persistent or is it like a rogue? It's a single player like thing. No, but I mean like oh is, it, is no no it's 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 a design map. So you you save your game and you continue you later. Save your game and you continue later. Your fan? Everything is designed. Yes, everything is designed. I like designed. that. I like that more than the procedural generated. Well, the procedural, procedural generated stuff can be incredible, but it's hard to do well. It's overwhelming sometimes. Well, um, speaking of art, artists and cartoons, uh, big fans of Rick and Morty in the house now. What what? I'm Pickle Rick. What but love dub dub? Did any of you go out to try to get Fuck some Szechuan no. sauce? No. First of all, there wasn't one here in the Bay Area. Yeah, there was. San really. Jose. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's where that great video of the guy jumping up on the screen, on the counter, screaming and spinning around on the floor, yelling, "I'm Nugget Rick" or something. <laughs> I thought really? that was. Um, I think that was San Jose, but I'm not. A, I'm not. Oh. I'm not a hundred percent. This whole the, thing was such a, a botched. Well, hold on, you know what happened, right? Well, McDonald's said, "Hey, they mentioned us in this cartoon, and people love it. Maybe we can take advantage of that without having to do any licensing fees." They, yeah, this, this is the, the so so they mentioned Szechuan. Nugget sauce, sauce in the, the premiere one. Yeah, yep. of Rick and Morty this year. And and people went bonkers for it. McDonald's sent Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon a, a gallon. giant gallon bucket of Szechuan sauce. Which is now on eBay for a million dollars for Puerto Rico or some charity or something. Yeah. Dollars, yeah. Hmm. yeah. And and people went, Roiland posted it on Twitter and people went bonkers. So then 
rather than contact Adult Swim and, and Harmon Productions and all that stuff and say, hey, here's how we would like to do this. We would like to tie this into your property and do a big promotion. Yada, Everybody yada. wins, yeah. Yeah, no, they just made the sauce and told people on Twitter or something that it was going to be out for one day only and sent like four packets to each store that was a promo- part of the promotion. It wasn't the one day only that was the problem, is that they didn't make any. They barely made any sauce, well, so, right? So the, did you see the packaging? The packaging had like... Rick and Morty style, stylized yeah. uh, type, and some cartoon characters, but had n- and color palette looks similar, but nothing actual Adult Swim Rick and Morty. No, no, like, but but the font that says Szechuan sauce is very much the Rick and Morty typeface. The the yeah. alien looks like one of the little pink aliens. It's just just off enough that legal would approve it. In, yep. in Rick and Morty, had they did they actually mention McDonald's? Yeah, yeah. And he says he so he he goes into the whole. So isn't it quid pro quo? So, okay, so the joke, there's a lot of layers to this. The joke in the episode is that Rick is such a nihilist that the only thing he cares about is this inconsequential thing that doesn't exist in his universe anymore. And that thing is is this, the Szechuan sauce for Chicken McNuggets that was only available for three months in 1989 when the Disney movie Milan came out as part of that tie-in. So it's a, it is literally a joke about how, what a horrific nihilist Rick, Rick is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how he doesn't, he can't appreciate anything anymore. And this is just the 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 MacGuffin that he is supposedly chasing, right? But that's not the point. And, and there are think pieces saying that Rick and Morty fans don't understand that. I think a lot of them do understand that. The reason they want the sauce is because it makes them fo- feel more inclusive and exclusive in in that fandom. It's not about what the, it actually it's meant also, in the show. It's about Justin Roiland has a sauce and was excited about it. Now I want this sauce just so I can owning, be special. It's owning the sauce. Like, McDonald's should have print not done, like, the Rick and Morty print on it. They should have either put Mulan on it, because that would have made it funnier. <laughs> yep. That would or, be really amazing. Yep, They'd yep. have to talk to Disney <laughs> to do that, though. Probably. Or just printed just a normal, like, Szechuan sauce in their normal typeface. Yeah. And that would have been fine. Right. Coincidental people Szechuan wanted, sauce. People wanted the collectible. And, and, it, and it sounds like and make enough. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. So, by the way... I've made Szechuan sauce. There's a binging with Babish episode where, recipe. He, yeah. where he gets sent some of the original Szechuan oh, really? sauce wow. and then recreates it. Wow. And it's not that hard of a recipe. I encourage you to try it. I did I did the thing that Disney that uh, McDonald's this, posted years ago about how to make your own Big Mac. Like the McDonald's chef made a YouTube video that was here's how to make a Big Mac on the sauce and everything at home. How'd it go? It was good. All right. Tastes like a Big Mac. I think we're pushing Jeremy to the point where he's going to quit the podcast. It's like, <laughs> what are they talking now, about? You know what? I can't wait to watch Rick and Morty. I'm this is the it. longest pop culture news ever. I know. Thanks, Well, We are Sorry. over an hour into the show. Hey, uh, Star Trek Discovery, you guys still watching? Yeah, you know, I'm one behind. Okay. But uh, you encouraged me to watch episode three, and so yep. I did. And, I, and man, unexpected. Did you I'm like t- it? It's scary. Yeah, I did. Like, it was like alien scary. Like there, it, it there's felt that, like a Battlestar Galactica that episode. Mission? Yeah, is this worth watching? Yes, it is absolutely. I'm you only subscribe through... to all access. I don't. My wife does. Not... What, 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 what? Does she not what? share the account with Look, you? I don't watch a lot of TV. <laughs> You're these one days. of the rare people that subscribe to all access for not Star Trek Discovery. She watches a lot of watch... CBS other stuff. Go go ahead and watch Star Trek Discovery. It's it's I'm really gonna, long. Though. I'm going to tell you, don't watch it because it's Star Trek. It's yeah. not Star watch Trek, it because yeah. it's sci-fi. Okay. Oh. Okay. I like That's that. good advice. I'm only through episode yeah, two. Yeah, I, I heard worrisome stuff about like the 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 captain, like the captain being kind of smarmy and the crew having infighting and all the things that Star Trek is not about. Exactly. There, if you are looking for Star Trek, look yeah. elsewhere. Okay. Look, look it, at the it is, go watch DS9 again. That's what is, you're saying. Yeah. This is so much better than DS9. What? Have you no, only so seen the, one episode of DS9. <laughs> so, you saw a double episode. You haven't given it enough of a shot. Which episode of DS9 did you the watch? Emissary. We did you can, you can compare material. the pilots to, of DS9 to Discovery, and it is no contest. This well, look, 20 years apart. CBS spent three years making the pilot of Discovery. And $8 million an episode. Holy fuck, really? Yeah. Man, man. We no. should know. We should show CBS. you the, the pilot for Enterprise, and then you will you will offer your forgiveness oh, wa- to DS9. I watched the pilot for Enterprise the other day, so maybe I should watch Enterprise before I watch Discovery. The answer nope. to that is no. Nope. Discovery theme is also growing on me. The, the opening theme. I wish I No, 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 That's Jurassic Park. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, no, And one last thing worried. in the pop culture. Uh, minute, uh, quick. Let's see, hear Kishore's review of Inhumans. Inhumans is garbage, and it makes you feel bad. And if you watch it, you're also garbage because it's terrible. Oh my god! Oh, wow. It is one of the worst 
things what? I've watched. Uh, here, here, I'll give you my one sentence recap of the, of the premiere. Hair clippers and the shearing of someone's hair is a key plot element. So and, is it about Samson? It's basically, Medusa. Oh, uh, when when they do slow mo hair clipping, I was like, I'm out. Can yeah. we just not talk about this anymore? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, a couple weeks ago, we reported that Apple is dipping its toes into content, making content. And they have a um, just a bankroll. I think they said they were going to potentially put a hundred or a billion dollars, sorry, a billion dollars into uh, shows, hundred million dollar shows, you know, Westworld caliber, HBO caliber shows. It seems like they've signed their first one. It is with Steven Spielberg's Amlet Entertainment, and it's for a 10-episode series uh, of amazing stories. Hell yeah, man. That show's great. You remember the show? Because it, it, it was, it was like when a, I was a kid. Yeah, it was like a Twilight Zone in that every episode was different. But it was a, it was an, it was a variety yeah. slash anthology show. But I'm saying there weren't recurring characters. Yeah. There wasn't Sometimes a story were. to follow. The I mean, animated dog popped up every once in a while. Oh, fine. Yeah, yeah. But, but the plots were different. It was yeah. all different stuff. And it was always different directors, too. Yeah. So that that's a big trend. And New York Comic Con, um, I mean, we're big fans of Black Mirror, for example, which started off as a UK anthology show tapping into uh, the dangers of technology. Uh, but uh, Philip K. D- uh, Amazon has now a Philip K. Dick series. Uh, it's Philip K. K. Dick's which, Electric which... Dreams. It's his short stories turned into movie long mm. anthology episodes hmm. that are going to be on Amazon. It's Android's v- Dreaming of Electric Sheep. Electric Sleep. It's Sheep. called it's oh, called and this electric, one's called electric sleep. So it's electric dreams. Basically, it's wow. it's the, the it's like Blade Runner and yeah, it's they're uh, an hour. I think they're an hour, maybe even longer. Uh, I think Amazing Stories was only thirty minutes when I was a kid. So this is very much in the same vein. And and you know, Wired had a story this week about uh, you know ten years ago, it used to be comic books that publishers and and studios were mining for content, and right now it really seems to be uh, science fiction short stories, which is great. I'd love to yeah, see more science infinite, fiction store stories yeah. turn and, and money put behind turning putting those on screen. There's decades of material. To and pull even from. it's re- revisiting similar stories that had been covered in Outer Limits or Amazing Stories or Twilight Zone. Those themes are you know told with today's directors and written by a more diverse cast of storytellers would be wonderful. I'd much rather. I mean, I'd, like the the original Twilight Zone run is one of the greatest things on TV of all time, right? Yep. But I'd much rather they go back and make new stories that are more relevant in the modern day than. I mean, isn't that what than, Black Mirror is? Kind of. I mean, it, it is Twilight through the lens of modernity. Yeah. Right. And if they're going to modernity, do modernity. Um. I yeah. I I just. I mean, I'd rather tell new stories oh than God. revisit. They had some William Shatner's monster on the edge of the airplane again. <laughs> they had some heavy hitters. The original series. Not only did they have Steven Spielberg directing episodes, they also had, um, for whatever reason, Burt Reynolds, Michael D. Moore. They had. Uh, Different Michael Moore. No, but Michael yeah. D. Moore yeah, yeah, is yeah. the TV magnate of the 80s, yeah. And then uh, Clint Eastwood. They had Martin Scorsese. amazing stories. Yeah, Martin yeah. Scorsese. Irving wow. Kushner. Interesting. Wow. I feel like this is a, this, the 80s, I feel like Amazing Stories was probably wasted on the 80s. They put it on a, like Wednesday night, I remember. It was on after some, uh, a night court or something like that. And it was, it was hard to get my parents to let me stay up late enough to watch. I loved it. All right, let's fully jump into tech because there was a big event this past week. Google had a hardware event to announce phones, uh, speaker systems, earbuds. Uh, let's start with the phones. So the Pixel 2 and Pixel 2 XL. Kishore, what do you think? <laughs> Pixel 2. Uh, I think it, it okay. So I think in terms of its actual, like, the, the specs of the phone, like, it, its upgrades, I think they're fine. I'm most interested in the camera tech where they don't need two cameras to create the bokeh effect. You mean the double pixel? Yeah. Yeah, or two-sided yeah. pixel? Yeah, whatever that's called. Yeah. Uh, um, but the price point is ridiculous and they have no supply yeah a thousand bucks and i think it's already back ordered well, out, out and that's this is the X, xl is a thousand bucks the, or non-xl the, the non-xl starts at 650 yeah um the, the thing that's changed is that the two is the non-xl is made by one company and the xl is made by another company so basically it's nexus all over again well yeah and and like the two looks exactly like the old phone it, it's yeah. not a, it's not an edge to edge 
it's I mean it is OLED, which is sort of with or, uh, the XL is OLED. Is that what you're talking about? The XL? Well, the, so the XL is edge to edge at least. Mm -hmm. Although it's diff really difficult to tell how edge to edge it is from the pictures, or maybe the way the UI mm -hmm. on the phone works. Um, the big thing that came out to me was that they're adding live photos or a live photo analog, and um, and the the portrait mode, which are two of the things I miss most coming from iOS. Really, to, you wanted the live photos? Man, with a four year old. Live mm. photos are real good. Okay. Yeah. I I, I kind of met over the the live photos, especially like the living background uh, on your screen, because uh, that I, that part just didn't seem to bring much value. So the 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 thing about capturing a second or two of video on either side of the snap that you take the picture, a helps with shutter lag, and b generates some of the best gifs that I've ever seen. Uh, when okay. you're like taking an action shot of some little kids doing stuff. Now you can actually choose what frame your photo is from the whole live photo oh, really? sequence too. On iOS? Uh, as of iOS 11. Oh, that's nice. That's so important because the previous one yeah. sucked. Yeah. I have to say the other thing about the the non-XL that I don't like though on the screen is that the it's still curved at the at the edges. It's yeah. not like you don't get the square. So you like lose all that corner space. Well, and I it's think like, it's a different design. Like the industrial design on the phones is different. The yep. small one has chamfered edges. The big one's round. It's weird. I, I did order a round one. You did? Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to keep it or not. If I'm going to keep the pre-order. I, I didn't get it in the first wave. Oh, so how far are they? Like October December? 27th or something? Oh, that's not that bad. No, no, no. I mean, it looks so much like the LG G6. It does. Like, isn't I mean, old, they all all phones look the same. But Norm. if this one's made by LG and it's the same same design ID. Oh, the little one. No, the big one. No, the big one's made by HTC, isn't it? No, 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 no. No, LG, did I have it LG, backwards. Yeah, LG makes the big one. LG oh. makes because the big one. Because the OLED. Oh right. Uh, what do you think about the contextual awareness? That kind of like half AR thing with the photos, where you can take photos of stuff and like context uh, about it will will pop up. The machine learning thing. Yeah, I thought that, I think that's neat, but I'm creeped out by it. I'm I I don't see the utility of that. Huh? Because it's not like just an overlay. You have to like take a photo of something, and then it does processing. And I just don't see people using it in that way. Um. So the one thing I will say as a user of Google Photos is that they do that on the photos that you upload to the service right now. But that helps you with searching. And it's and, awesome yeah. for because yeah. I can type dog and it shows me all the pictures of the dog. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So like uh, on this podcast, I've like searched for photos from certain times and used that that feature. That's amazing. But that's really a, like an archival situation. Like well, but if it happens, indexing for searching. If it happens in hardware on the phone while it's being shot, then that means that that'll happen faster and be immediate rather than. I guess so. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, the thing that I thought was interesting is the squeeze. So why did you think that was interesting? I, Tell me about the squeeze. Yeah. So you can squeeze the phone, and it's basically another context-aware gesture. Mm -hmm. The problem I have is that the Pixel XL that I have now <laughs> supports a bunch of context-aware gestures. But you're talking of. about squeezing the sides. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like this. What what type of? I mean, I this hold is my like hand. force what, force touch for or what, 3D touch. What does it do? It, I think whatever you want, right? Yeah, you can program it to do that. So like I like right now I so I have a live case and I program the back button that's an NFC push button to open the camera. But you have to push really effing hard. It would be really mm. nice to get it to, to, to squeeze the side and get it to go to the one thing that I use most frequently. So I mean they pitched squeeze as a launch assistant. Yeah. Um but uh I don't know. I, I think voice for launching assistant is gonna be more useful than the actual squeeze. Probably. Okay. Uh, always on screen too, which is nice for OLED. It is I think the OLED screen is a is a good move forward. I just can't see, like if this was in the six hundred dollar range and they really undercut Apple's pricing. Yeah, this would be much more attractive than than where they ended up, which is basically equivalent. So, as somebody who was on an iPhone until pretty recently, um, the stuff that I miss from iPhone is iMessage, the live photos, portrait mode. And to a lesser extent, the watch. Like the Apple Watch is much more useful on a day to day than the Android Watch. The Android and they didn't Watch is fix bad. It. Yeah. I was bummed that there weren't any fixes there. I don't think they're ever going to be able to fix iMessage, but I, I'm, I mean, just because Apple is not going to let that out, uh, I was disappointed that the um, watch stuff wasn't addressed more. Yeah. I, I will say, though, they made a big deal about how good the camera score was. 
So, so the camera score, when you say score, you're talking about DSO, DXO, DXO mark yeah. score, yeah. which is highly subjective. There are charts and graphs, but those, if you look at the y-axis of those charts and graphs, it is subjective analysis sure. that sometimes it's kind of suspect. It, it, me, it at least indicates that it's worth checking out how the phone performs in the wild. And, which, and it's also talking about image quality specifically, not talking about experience in terms of how long it takes to load the app, how much, the, what the frame rate is on, on the, um, the, your, your screen, the, through the pass through, the preview. Yeah. Um, and so none of that is evaluated. And I think that's a huge, hugely important part of the, the footage, camera experience. Do you do low light stuff? Yeah. Like they, low they, light is where the Pixel XL that I have they, has they been ex- they, exceptional. They, they have image quality in, in, the, in the JPEGs down and they go, they scrutinize those to bits. Some of that stuff I think still is, is up for debate in terms of how valid they are as a score. But the thing they don't do is all the experiential stuff. I mean, the thing, the thing when I look at a score like that that has subjective components, I assume that they're looking at where this stacks up against all the current devices. And if this has a higher number than the other phones that are already available, like the iPhone 8 and the Galaxy Note 8, then, then that's that's all that indicates is that this is producing better pictures in most in, in the situa- scenarios in the scenarios that they test. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, okay, lots more. The, I think the best thing that they they showed. Can we talk about the buds? Yes, the yes. earbuds. So one hundred and eighty dollars yeah. earbuds. One hundred and sixty dollars. That's a new, new normal. Bucks. I mean, I think is? Apple that's has what? normalized when the AirPods were announced. They thought people and and some people still think they were too expensive. Well, but if, it is the most used accessory I use on an iPhone. The the lowest. Like before the AirPods, the 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 low end for Bluetooth earbuds was like a hundred bucks uh, the, for the, the ones with the cord. Right. I mean, there were lower end ones, but they they were bad. Uh, the cord, you mean that goes around the, the one back. that goes around the back of your yeah. neck. Yeah. Um, so this one still has a cord. Yeah. For the the Google one, so it's a cord. And I believe the cord is for antenna. That's I mean the reason that AirPods on Apple side don't look, they connect? But they they connect right. But so it, it means there's only one receiver. And and I think it's also you bury the antenna in there as well. Well, because okay. the Apple has you, in you the need, stump in in the Apple has the antenna in the stump, which is why they look like weird yeah. earrings. Yeah. But that's only the way with current antenna technology you can get away with not having a cord. Yeah, yeah. So so the the Pixel Buds obviously a pair with Android phones. I, I assume they work with other Android phones, so they definitely work with Pixels. Um, but the demo that they gave with them, they didn't talk about sound quality or any of that stuff at all. No, it's about translation. The demo that they gave is real-time universal translator. Babelfish. Babelfish. They had somebody speaking Swedish on stage, talking uh, talking to someone speaking English, and she was hearing the English to Swedish translation, and then he was hearing the Swedish to ang- English back. So it, I didn't see that. I watched a, a, a recap that would cut that out. Yeah. So is it a real-time, real-time translation? Yeah. It's like you're at the United Nations. Uh, probably faster than that would so be my guess. So how does your brain wow. comprehend hearing, seeing mouth move, hearing the audible of a different language, and then also training yourself to ignore that and listen to the translate? I, my guess is that the earbuds are noise isolating enough that it's not a problem. If you think about how like you, it, like if you have in earbuds that are, use comfort tips or something like that that go all the way into your ear so canal, it's isolation, then not they reduction. isolate, not redu- reduce. Yeah, I think that's amazing. I, I think like that the, sounds like magic. Why? Why not reduce? What do you mean? Like, I mean, why not do it with the software? Yeah, well, why not dampen audio dampen with software reduction? What it's, in, it's ingesting, hard. it's and hard. then also output. So my understanding is it's much easier to mask like background noises, droning, and stuff like that, than to take out the actual cadence of a person's voice. But I don't know. That's true. No, no, no. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely right. I right. want to try that. Oh, I, I so desperately want to try these. Did you order them? Uh, I didn't, and I'm kind of bummed because now they're back ordered for fucking. Uh, well, so in all the ways that Google bungles hardware stuff, this is the most frustrating. Is that if you don't get into the initial allocation, out of stock. then they give you out of stock. I want to be in Japan having conversation with someone and go, hold on, hold on, I need better reception before I yeah, can. Right. Well, so so this is the other thing is you What's can pull that stuff. Buy? You can pull that stuff and get it offline. Right. So you can store the the. I think it's using the the new stuff that's in Google Translate now. You can wait a minute. The, the translation is not cloud based. Uh, hold on. I think it's trend. And so here's the thing: different hardware providers are doing um, are doing stuff like visual recognition and audio recognition on chip now, mm-hmm. um, and they can do it instantly. So, like when you use Google Translate now on your phone, at least on your Android phone, you can. Uh, here we go. Offline translation. You can download different languages to translate offline now. And like if I download Korean, it's a 43 megabyte file. Yeah. And yeah. then it can all be processed and locally. And it can be processed locally. I love it. Yeah. I don't know if that's just for visual or for audio as well. Oh, man. That's that's like the uh, 
I mean, but, but here's the thing is if those earbuds don't sound good for music and all the millions of other things I use earbuds for work. every day, I'm not going to buy them no matter how I, magical they are. I still think the cord might still pose a problem. I, I, I've used um, the, the earbuds that I use most often are behind the back of the ear ones. I remember you used to review a bunch of those. Yeah. And, and you talked about it like how they would cinch would make a big difference mm-hmm. in your quality of the experience. So I think there's a lot to be learned about how the, this cord's going to sit on you and it's going to get tangled if at all. Yeah, like if I was regularly wearing like a long braid, I would probably be much less enthusiastic about these than I am as not a long ponytail. Wait, we're not ro- we're not growing braids. I thought we had a braid. Rat, rat tails, man, rat tails. I guess the, if you think about the experience of actually traveling with these in order to have a conversation with people that you can't communicate with, you you still have if you you're going to be the only one who has these earbuds, right? They're not going to have these. That's fine. Yeah, so you still rely on the you know the traditional Google Translate experience. For going that direction. Well, so so the way it worked is the woman with the earbuds in was speaking and holding out a phone. Yeah. And the person that didn't have the earbuds on was hearing the phone. Yeah, right. And the person who had the earbuds on was hearing, obviously, the, the earbuds. It's just, because I've used it yeah. um, to speak Spanish. And it's 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 there's something about being in a groove where I talk, it listens, it translates, and then you talk, and, and it works the same way. Not having that symmetry It seemed like might, this might was working simultaneously while he was still talking. Or while she was still talking, rather. We it have can to also try be it language out. dependent. It like, could be language. There's, I mean, all, there's all, so many, like, this is a thing that has to be tested. It's not going to work for the rival aliens who talk backwards. <laughs> what, do they talk backwards or do they just see through time? Yeah, I don't think this has a time uh, time factor. If we could break the fourth dimension, I would pay more than $150 for them. Yeah, that's fair. Any other interesting things? There, have, the there's m- a lot of other announcements. There's a lot of speakers. Like, the mini? The mini. Yeah. Hey, are you guys going to go to the donut pop-up in San Francisco later this week? Wait, what? Okay. Is this another like museum of ice cream thing? It's a Google's hosting a donut pop up to celebrate the mini. What, what kind of, they got like Blue Star? What they got? If Could, it is Dynamo, I'd be in. Because it I looks like a donut. Is. I get yeah. it. That's good. That's good Fif- stuff. Fifty bucks seems like the right. Hey Norm, do I do you know? Do I need to put more money on my meter? You're good. You're good. Um, it seems like fifty bucks is the right price for that thing. It's the Echo Dot. For the mini. It's an Echo Dot, yeah. but yeah, you know, uh, that's fine. Yeah, okay. that Amazon Show prices got dropped significantly after the YouTube launch because the YouTube removal. Because they're not selling. Because Probably. they're not selling. Yes. But they're blaming the YouTube. Mm-hmm. Wait, can hold we... on. Is the Echo, is the small one 99 bucks or 50 bucks? Uh, are you talking about Google or Amazon? Google. Google should be 50, I think. Mini is oh, 50. Oh, Amazon, oh, did we talk about that? Did you guys talk about that? Oh, and they launched a big one that's $400 or something. Yeah. And it's like a big grown up speaker. I don't know. Can, can we talk about the Clip just for a second? The weirdest product. Tell me, know. explain that to me. The Clip is basically a, a mini camera mm-hmm. that's on a, like a tile like. You know, it's it seems like factor. it's like the Pixel camera. Yeah, and it's two hundred fifty bucks, and you can just place it somewhere, and it'll connect to your phone. But and just... it, without connecting to the cloud, it will do image recognition, so it knows when people are mm-hmm. are in the shot, and then start capturing video. So the idea is that you can go to a park for a birthday party, hang clip, clip a couple of these on trees, and when kids run in frame playing their football or whatever or dodgeball. They will get you'll get video of that. Let me know when you are going to go to the park and hang a couple of thousand dollars worth of little cameras, cameras on, on the trees, trees exactly. and I'll be right there. Exactly. Um, the interesting thing about this is that we're these we're starting to see the benefits of hardware of chip manufacturers embedding machine learning acceleration yeah. in silicon. Yeah. So rather than having to dump it up to the cloud and rely on these big machines, they have little subsets of what those what those algorithms can do on these lo- tiny low powered chips. And that's how stuff like this works. And, and it's already that, seated with, with you know, whatever decades of all, all of the machine learning that Google's already done. Well, in tune for whatever the application is, presumably for that yeah. device. So, we, like, this is the very beginning of that, and we're going to see a lot more stuff like that in the coming years. Dogs and families. Uh, any other bits from the Google hardware did, event? Did you talk about the new Echoes? Was that last week too? Yeah, we did. Uh, yeah, it was a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. yeah, the big surprise event. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the alarm clock one looks interesting. I don't care. <laughs> well, the, why'd you ask? Oh, well, the, the, no, the ninety-nine dollar redesign. Jesus. The ninety-nine dollar redesign. Wow. <laughs> the <laughs> the ninety-nine dollar redesign of the main Echo it seems compelling. Okay. Yeah. I, I think from a design standpoint, it looks better. I'm interested to see how it sounds. That's what I was curious about. Yeah, because the original Echo sound is still pretty garbagey. It's it's 
okay at really specific kinds of music. Yeah. yeah like if you're listening to NPR or Troll whatever, it's soundtrack fine. it's fine for. Then that's fine. <laughs> so uh, we are now three weeks away from uh, the pre order of iPhone 10. Okay. The X. And uh, the 8's obviously out. And iPhone 10 will have fast charging. Uh, but, uh, and I guess the iPhone 8 has fast charging. Uh, wireless uh, charging, I mean. They both have wireless charging, but they also have potential for fast charging. Now, Dan uh, Lowenhurst tweeted and did some testing, and this is really interesting. Apple advertised fast charging with if you buy a fast charging at wall wart, But does it come with one? No. It comes with a 5-watt wall wart like every iPhone the hell? used to have, which is super slow charging. Now, you can always plug your iPad one, your 10-watt yeah. one. Uh, but the new one is oh. going to be... Uh, up to 87 watt charger. It's like a laptop charger. Basically. But based on his analysis, the advantage you get, the time it takes, for example, let's say 50% is a good good benchmark, right? From zero to 50. If you're on a, a 10 watt charger, uh, yeah, it'll take you uh, about 40 minutes to get 50%. With the new one, you only get 10 minute bonus. It's only 30 minutes. For 100%, basically... Difference is about 30 minutes for well, 100%. Because the last 20, 10, 20% is always going to be slow, slow because of the way yeah. lithium ion batteries work. Yes. But the point is, huh. I can't believe Apple still is only bundling 5 watt chargers, which is by far the slowest. Using an iPad charger on your iPhone is going to be your best bet most well, of the and time. And people also plug into USB. So that's yeah. that's much faster than 5 watt. I mean, the, the, five watt the, charger. Thing, the thing to do is to go to Amazon and buy one of those Anker five port charger things and it will charge everything at whatever the fastest it can go is not 87 watts those need better form factors there are there are i have one that travels that has a fold out plug just like oh, your ipad charger and it's a four that. port with yeah. a with a USB C. I think i want that. that one is the best okay very cool i guess the five watt is, is one amp so yeah maybe usb is only maybe twice that if you're lucky i don't know what C does USB C goes really high. It does. Yeah, because you can charge you, your laptop charges on USB C. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, it's got that super, that probably the same power adapter that they're using for the iPhone. Yeah. All right, let's talk about some obscure pieces of technology that's not a smartphone that may be interesting to us. First of all, Sony seems to be bringing back a new iBo. Yeah, did you, did you, it's do you, time. Do you remember iBo? Yeah, yes. we had one at the office at Maximum PC. Yeah, you did. PlayStation Briefly. magazine. Had I it. remember seeing this at the Sony store. So it's a, this is a robotic dog, and you could hold a ball in front of it, a pink and, ball, and, and it recognized the ball and would walk around. Yeah. I felt like it was a little ahead of its time. It maybe, was unimpressive. Maybe now's the time. It was really, really cool for about twenty-five or thirty minutes when yeah. we got it in, and probably and cost a thousand dollars. It literally now, cost fifteen hundred dollars. I don't want this to have digital assistant functionality. What, you I just want to be a pet? Yes, if you're going to design a, a, the, the structure, the form factor of this robot to yeah. be an animal, make it, a, make it smart in that way. I don't need to ask it for... I, I don't want Poochie. Norm, you have a dog, correct? I have, yes. I love my dog. Is your dog... Does, does not make calendar appointments for me. Does wake me up every morning at 5 a.m., but I guess... Yeah, that's just that's just that's just being. A dog. I mean, yeah. if if it was anthropomorphic and it walked around your house, then you'd be mm-hmm. okay with it turning on your thermostat. No. Oh no! I, if I, if you're going to vote engineering and design into a robot dog, make it the best robot dog mm. and robot pet. Well, it might be that. You don't know that the, the smart home stuff is free. They get that for free if they have Wi-Fi. I think it's completely unnecessary. Yeah, maybe so. So what um, does it do? I, they don't know yet, but all we know is that it might have the smart home technology built into it. Is, is this from the Sony research, like the deep research in Japan? Presumably? Yeah, they're, they're putting the team back together. They're bringing the Ibo team back together. Wow. Yeah. I, w- I want one. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. I'm going to go tell you, friend. Ridley, Ripley, my, my dog doesn't like inanimate things that behave like animate things. My guess, judging by the level of neuroses your dog has exhibited, yep. probably is going to be very similar. She, she like hates drones. bowls. She hates bowls. Bowls. She hates bowls. Yeah. Even when there's ice cream inside. Yeah. She likes balls. She loves balls, hates bowls. Yeah. Bowls are half balls. Empty. Yeah. So who has a SNES Mini? I do. You do? You got one? You do. No, what? I just took my NES Mini and put oh, Hakshi on it and put the SNES ROMs on and got some 
8 bit dough controllers, which cost the same as the SNES Mini, That's and now right. I have a wireless NES Mini that plays SNES yep. games. And you've had it for a year? You have it for a year? Yeah, no, I've had it for like four months because I bought it from the from the ripoff sale that oh, Thinking did. did. Oh. Well, if you did get a SNES Mini, you can also now also enjoy what Will has done and put uh, Hatchie on it. Put whatever this is games, the big question. Put whatever games you like. We didn't know. It's the same hardware, right? I don't know. Seems like it. So that's that's the other question. Since we don't have one, we can't test it. But is it faster? The UI is yeah. different. The base UI is, of course, different. The controllers yeah. have the shoulder buttons. Uh, but you can buy this third party. And they're longer cables. Not long cables? Maybe yeah, long. longer cables. cables. Long cables. Yeah. You, get two controllers. you get two controllers. So if you didn't get a SNES, and this is hackable now, it's in your best interest to get the SNES Mini and hack that. They're going to re-release the NES Mini, wrongs. too. Is they're what they said. Re- they said they're going to re-release the NES Mini as well. Right, but at this point, they're more, the ergonomic form factor of the SNES controllers, that's a better buy. It's far superior. It's well, a little you, more expensive. You, you can play SNES games, and you can play yeah, because native SNES with games. Just the first one can run SNES games, but the controller doesn't have all the buttons. You need to well, buy. You, the so, you, so, so I motor. bought the eight bit dough Bluetooth yeah. SNES. I bought the Famicom version because it has the red, white, blue, and green buttons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or red, blue, whatever the four color buttons. That's the way to do it. Um, it's, so and, the, the port but is, it's a pain in the ass to set up. Like it was hard to set that up. I, I bought some Nintendo Wii controllers, uh-huh. long ones, and those work too. Yeah, because it's just a Wii port. Yeah, yeah, not USB. It's uh, the Wii. It's the it's the thing that came out of the Wii mote and went into the, the yeah. nunchuck. Right, right, right. So, I know a bunch of people did get it. Did you see it? We know Dan Stapleton, who works at IGN. He bought an Amazon. He got, he got fear. He saw his naps. He got pre-ordered for no. launch day. It's been a week and a half. He Twitter shamed Amazon. I pre-ordered Amazon. from totally. Walmart, and they just canceled my order. Yeah. This is. I thought Nintendo would have learned their lesson. No. This is the Szechuan sauce well, for hardware. So the thing that Nintendo said is don't buy aftermarket because we're going to make enough of these so that everybody that wants one can get one. Not day one. Now, what I'm surprised about... These are 30-year-old games. You don't need to play 30-year-old games on day one. Absolutely. <laughs> You're correct. I'm surprised. Isn't everyone surprised that they didn't fix the hacking problem? Yes. I'm actually... I, I'm really thrilled that they didn't fix the hacking problem. That's not what I'm asking. I I expected... <laughs> when we talked about this last year, I said, yeah, they're going to release a SNES Classic next year, and they're going to fix the hacking problem. Yeah. That's what we all thought. Yeah. So why did they? Because they're not selling games for it. Oh, that's the other question. Why isn't there Wi-Fi built into it, and why aren't they selling game packs? Well, what's the margin that they have on a few pieces of plastic and a ten-dollar teensy board or whatever is in there? <laughs> they make money. Right? They're making money on the hardware, yeah. But they could make so much more on the games. I mean, maybe could they? I I'm kind of done buying virtual. I like, I bought a bunch of virtual console games for the Wii. I think you. I bought like, a few virtual console games for Jeremy the Wii U. Described it. You get people to buy the packs. Don't just have an unlimited store. Make it an event thing. Six months later, another pack of 20 games. I mean, okay, here's the other way to look at it. No matter how hard they make it to hack, somebody's going to figure it out, yep. right? Mm-hmm. If you put a USB port in there, yeah. Yeah, so, and the people who are going to take the time and effort to figure that out probably aren't going to spend any money on games ever. So why not get the 80 bucks? They charge a little bit more for this one. They put a few fewer games on it. Why not? Why not get what you can out of those people? We all get a really easy, nice interface for our for our you know ROM games in the living room with good controllers and the whole thing, and Nintendo makes a little scratch on the side. I'm not everybody's s- happy. No, I, dude, why do you want? All, why do you want them to lock this? Why do you want to take this away from us, Jeremy? I'm happy. I'm, I got the NES. I got the Hackchi. It's done. But they took that off the market so quickly that I assumed well they must hate this hacking problem. They're going to get that off. They're going to release a Super Nintendo with that USB port removed. No DFU mode, no nothing. It's going to yeah. have Wi-Fi in it so they can phone home, make sure that you're not hacked. I'm really surprised that it had an external USB port again. Yeah. I expected it's, them to go to a dongle and then make you solder some shit on to get the yeah. USB port How back. How many people do you think are actually doing the hack, though? It is so easy. It uh, is, it's not that it's hard, but it, how, it's still yeah. effort. I'm 90%. I don't know, man. Really? I don't I, think it's that much. I bet it's 10. Given that the people who are playing this are old schoolers. <laughs> just complete opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. I'll tell you in a sec. This is, guy, this is why you guys were such a good team. <laughs> no agreement whatsoever. The people, uh, the people playing this are old schoolers. And yeah, of the, course. The, they, it, all you have to do is download a thing from GitHub. There, it, the scarcity stuff still bothers me, but there must be method behind the madness. Well, look, I think that they looked at what at what they can sell. Um, I think they looked at how the likelihood of reselling virtual console games bundled up the best of the platform. And rather than then continue to devalue those games in all of our eyes by doing like a buy twenty for twenty bucks deal, 
they're they're saying, look, here's what eighteen games or something for eighty dollars, and and so we still hold mental value of those. Because remember, like last generation, they were selling these games for ten dollars on the virtual console each. Yeah, that's bonkers. So so they've already devalued those a lot. I don't think they want to devalue them anymore by selling them as bundles. Okay. Well, interesting stuff. It's also interesting that you can get like the Atari version and the Genesis version and have been able to for months and they've never sold out. I'm gonna, I don't want to tell you anything. I don't <laughs> want to surprise hurt your feelings. Most of the Atari games, almost oh, all of the Atari games are bad. They're all bad. They have not aged. I mean, they were no. great at the time. Yes. They have not aged well. That's right. Same thing for Genesis games. Is that true? Because people love the Genesis. No. Like five people love the Genesis. No. <laughs> NHL 93 and 94. Yes. Still so very playable. What about NHL Commodore 94? 64? Madden 94. I never had a Commodore 64, so I don't really. It was a bad well, Apple here's show. Here's a chance. There's the C64 Mini. No, I'm cool. Thanks. It's like the best Commodore 64 games included. I got, I got one of those at, at Walgreens in like 1989, 2005. It was 64 just a games. Well. Wow, 64. 64 games. Do they have classics like Pirates Adventure and <laughs> Never played a single Commodore Runner. 64 game. BC's cl- Quest for Tires. Really? Yeah. Do you remember that one? No, I didn't okay. have a Commodore 64. Hold on. Let's see. I, what, I, what I, what are the looking hot? at this joystick, my hand already hurts. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, like playing the NES Classic with the original gamepad, painful. Wait, does the keyboard work? This is the actual C64? It's a mini. That's the, actually, the keyboard would have to work, wouldn't it? Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> they just you sold know? one. First one out the gate. Is it a mechanical keyboard, too? Oh so man! Get some like no. premium oh, parts in there. That would be nice. Get those yeah. cherry, cherry MX Ooh. Reds. So, do you think some they will make a Nintendo 64 version? I don't it? know that they can with the existing hardware. So, the existing hardware has an N64 emulator that doesn't run some of the more interesting games. Well, forget, it's okay. Forget so, the, just the point of like, would they develop a small yeah. form factor with a to have you know they would let's say even at raise another twenty bucks on the price. I don't. How many Nintendo 64s did they sell in the first place? Like a 500? But a doesn't thousand, matter. Maybe? The attach rate. They, they, the first party games were what people I'm just, cared I'm totally about. Kidding. They didn't sell many Nintendo 64s, right? Is that true? People, no. You put GoldenEye and Mario 64 on that and it's all you need, it's going to sell. They're not going to sell GoldenEye because it's licensed. That's the problem. If it yeah. doesn't have a GoldenEye, no sale. So you're going to get Mario 64 and Pilot Wings and Ocarina and Majora's Mask and four players. snowboarding. Four players. Yeah, so, For what? But I'm wondering if they'll do it because I think that there's a sweet spot with 16-bit. I think that the pixel art yeah, the, is something that is people are remaking those games today because it looks sweet. And I'm not sure that the 3D from N64 actually holds its uh, so, as well. So well, the, HD, the thing you need a scaler. If you play, mm. if you played some of the GameCube games that were re-released on the Wii and the Wii U, they that are flat shaded polygons like the original N64 stuff. That stuff scales up really well if you put AA and stuff on it. I think that if they do this, they have to do an HD update because they like they have to they have to do better lighting and any aliasing and all that stuff and that's more than just a simple like yeah the, the nest classic was a software update to the nest classic with new shell right yep the the and n64 s- scaling, classic can't be that scaling of 16 bit actually just keeps the pixel it art. still looks great it still looks great yeah it does there's no de- deterioration you don't see edges where they weren't there before i guess there's some aspects like the waterfalls and sonic like that that are supposed to be viewed on an interlaced tv mm-hmm. you can say that but generally speaking i think the 16 bit might be the sweet spot for this well and there's stuff like like with the nest classic there was stuff like if you play super dodgeball super Bo- super dodgeball today Right, because they can only move pixels on so many lines at a time, or something like that. There's weird flickering that really stands out in in the era of modern yeah. um, modern uh, bitmap games, pixel games. But but with the SNES, you don't have a lot of those problems. They like it's it's. I'm interested to to spend some time with it. Have any of you played Star Fox Two? You don't. Nobody has a SNES Classic. No, you so can. I, I don't have that ROM. I'd, so well, yeah, I guess reasons. the ROM had had been out there. I've never the, played it. The versions that were out there were like recreated versions. Oh, they weren't. The, they weren't the real game. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's my understanding. I have never. I never played Star Fox. I never owned a, oh. a SNES. <laughs> and Rush is awesome. <laughs> Leave. <laughs> hey, uh, more retro news. Uh, so this, I don't know how serious we should take this, but Adafruit posted a picture uh, over the weekend of Lady Ada uh, holding a what looks like a stock certificate. Uh, for Radio Shack. So the immediate assumption was that Adafruit, and it, it was posted with looks like there's some news about at Radio yeah. Shack. 2,000 likes. 
Lots of congratulations in the comment thread. Got to get them likes. So it looks like they bought a, some part of Radio Shack, <laughs> or they own at least a stock certificate. That might be it. That's it, huh? What What is Radio Shack worth? Like, there's no store. Maybe they bought a Radio Shack? <laughs> I think they bought the, for some reason, they bought these certificates, these uh, ownership certificates of, of Radio Shack, you know, from when oh, it like used to be. like old school paper stock certificates? Yeah, from when it used to be owned by somebody. Mm. They're all shut down now. Yeah, but, the Radio Shack by my house is a Payless shoe store now. So it's still in bankruptcy, and they're plan- they actually have plans to reemerge from it. They had to liquidate a number of stores, yeah. I knew that they liquidated them, and the one in my neighborhood survived, and then it went out of business. So but I, I there's still, four, like, I think there was something like 400 of the Radio Shacks were independently owned and operated. Oh, interesting. And the now, one in Sebastopol is, assuming it didn't burn down this what, week. So it sounds like this is nothing, but would it be an interesting move for Adafruit to have a national retail presence? That would be amazing. Do you want uh, an actual retail presence for I love- Adafruit? I, would, I love being able you to go do. to the store. It's Sunday. Jeremy I, does. I need yeah. stuff. There's a lot of people in the Bay Area who would love that. What if what about it was built into some type of prime shipping? Just better distribution. Local oh, distribution. Yeah, like faster shipping. Like, faster like, shipping. Like, Next like prime thing, now. You can prime get, now. It, exactly. get it this afternoon. Yeah. Well, that's not buying Radio Shack. That's buying like warehouse space. Yeah, or, but or I think having to deal with Amazon. That's and, the future of retail. Their, yeah. their, radio, uh, yeah. their uh, shelf space. When I'm at my Whole Foods, I want to get my Adafruit on the way out. Oh, here's the fresh Adafruit. I would oh, love man. that because Adafruit is the is really the best distributor for maker stuff, and they're only in New York City. It takes a long time to get out here. You yeah. have to pay for expensive shipping. Mm-hmm. All right, one last bit of tech news. Uh, we missed this because we weren't podcasting last week, but Elon Musk also had an event. Yeah, he basically was like, "Let's go full crazy." Yeah, Elon Khan. Yeah, he was like. <laughs> Hey, you know it takes too long to get places on this planet, so here's a video <laughs> on how you can get from anywhere on this planet in With 30 minutes. I feel like this man's pressed for time. <laughs> he's, he's, the, he's, the ballistic, <laughs> yes. He's solving his own problem. Look, you know, he's building also a shower in his rocket, so he can have some intense shower thoughts or sauna thoughts, at least. Hot tub thoughts. He's called, called the hot, t- hot tub time I just, machine. I just... I don't. I don't want to ride a ballistic missile, guys. <laughs> I don't want to ride one either. It doesn't sound because fun. Some people might. But why not just bring back the Concord? Think about that, Moss. Because he makes oh, rockets. Think yeah. about it, though, Will. You could go yes. Honolulu to New York in thirty minutes. I'm not in Honolulu or New York. That doesn't help me. <laughs> that, that's not an exaggeration, right? You could do that. Yeah, that's that's how yeah. ballistic missiles. That's why we. That's why we have twenty three minutes from when the the, <laughs> yes, the, the Koreans launch until we're no, a pile of ash in the floor of San Francisco. No one's arguing with the physics of this. It's it's he's also said that the cost would just be like a full fare economy flight at scale. And I was like, Rrr. how many people is he stacking into a dra- on the, like is it like a f- ladder that we all velcro onto on the top of a dragon capsule? Like wh- how 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 many people is he packing in here? This would be amazing. You guys, come on. Get on board with this. I look, I I came for the electric cars. I was okay with the solar panels. The, the batteries a, make sense. Name. I'm even down with the Hyperloop. And I've tried Soylent. I, I know that's not his, but it's equally crazy. <laughs> uh, look, the, this one, no nation state is going to let you launch passenger ballistic missiles <laughs> at their territory. Because it, it, all they have to do to make it a missile that kills people is not stop. <laughs> Though I do like the idea of landing on a barge because then you just take a ferry over the main city. That's nice. The ferry will take longer <laughs> than the fucking flight. That's the, right. This is true. Yeah, I love this idea. What about uh, uh, the same event talking about colonizing Mars and that amazing graphic of what a colony on Mars might look like? I didn't see that. It, so we, I think we should get out and it, out front of this and say the dates that he mentioned that we would have uh, elements on Mars by 2022. Um, seems a bit That's aggressive. Five years from now, <laughs> yes. Yeah, you can do a lot in five years. We got to the moon in five I, years, seven so, years. Uh, there's for sure, but we have. He still hasn't solved any. There's no indication that anyone has solved radiation and you know powerful rays from the sun affecting crewed missions uh, at all at this point. I mean, the only way that we know to really solve that is to surround the sheet. Uh, surround. The internals uh, of that ship with some sort of water-based type substance to absorb those rays. Water is really heavy, so the idea of getting some source of water out in space that they can sort of mine and then use to to in this rocket launch—that's what we're talking about. That's pretty Im- 
that's pretty excessive for but where I, we are. I thought the interesting thing about this is that what he's proposing is like the ship that goes back and forth to Mars just basically never stops, right? No, that's right. So he's talking about an orbital launch system, which is NASA's plan too. Yeah. Um, and so the idea of like putting a permanent sort of orbital launch system that'll ferry back and forth is it it is totally doable to deliver machinery. But it was when he started talking about humans that it started to hmm. lose a little weight. It isn't so much that uh, that I think there's some problem with just the fuel source. He has to get the fuel up there into orbit, and that's going to be hard to do just based on on the weight needs and then how you actually do any sort of refilling of that uh, of that BFR up there. But ah. asteroid mining. Maybe yeah, maybe he's been pointing spectroscopy spectroscopes at asteroids and has found something that's rich in. Uh, well, all know. that being said. The video made it look like his colony on Mars had the same lay- uh, layout as like Burning Man. <laughs> Very like, well, look along the av- avenue, spoken wheel. Life finds a way, man. <laughs> All right. Uh, before we move on to our next segment, I do want to thank the sponsor of this week's episode, and that sponsor is Casper Mattresses. Uh, Casper Mattress is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Supportive memory foams create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. And you can try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything because Casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit, especially if you're going to spend a third of your life on it. There's free shipping and returns to U.S. and Canada, and with over 20,000 reviews and average of 4.8 stars, it's quickly becoming the internet's favorite mattress. Now, you can also get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting www.casper.com slash test and using the offer code TEST, T-E-S-T. Terms and conditions apply. Now it's time for a moment of science. I want to talk about one of the things that, that always plagues us, and that's the ability to see where we can't actually see. And, and our friend Will Smith is here today to tell us about a problem that he had visualizing something in a location that you can't see because it relates to our science story this week. Will, tell us about your toilet. Oh, where'd the sun don't shine? Two Fridays ago, uh, I was sitting in my office and my wife came in and said, hey, I need some help with something. And I said, what do you need help with? And she said, well... I had just finished using the bathroom and flushed the toilet and got up and opened the medicine cabinet, which is above the toilet in my house, and something fell out, and it was a one in a million shot, and it went down the hole, and then it was gone. And I said, oh, well, that's probably okay. And so then we tried flushing something that was maybe not liquid, and it was not okay. So I did all the normal things. I plunged. Mm -hmm. I have an old house with old plumbing, so I own a toilet auger, and I augered. Toilet auger is like a snake on a stick. It's horrible. Don't, 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 hopefully you never need to use one. That didn't help. And so then I looked at like how you remove stuff that gets stuck in the gooseneck of a toilet. So it's the thing that keeps water in there so that you don't get sewer gases up into your house. It's an important part of the toilet. And um, at the same time, I realized while I was spending all this time with my toilet, I realized that there was a slow drip in the up top of the toilet. And looking at that, I realized I was going to have to replace all of the guts that make the toilet work in order to proceed. So... I decided in order to remove the stuck item from the toilet, basically what people said to do is dismantle the toilet, take it off of the floor, empty it out, take it up and dump it over and keep rotating it until whatever's stuck in the in the gooseneck falls out of the bowl. Yeah. So they basically Fuck told that. you to buy a new toilet. So I went and bought a new toilet. Yeah. Because if I was going to have to replace the guts and do all this other stuff, might as well just buy a new toilet. It's modern and up to date and flushes. I got a Kohler. So far, it's handled everything we've thrown at it. Oh. It's very impressive. <laughs> Congratulations. It's chair height. It's a different level than I was used to. Mm. Like, are you having some Soylent at home? So you're really putting it to the no, test? Soylent doesn't do that anymore. Soylent just gives you an anaphylactic shock these days oh, when it goes yeah. bad. Well, the reason I bring this up is that scientists have published a, a paper about Old Faithful, the geyser in Yellowstone. And one of the issues they have is they want to know the water source for Old, old Faithful. Oh, I hope it's not my toilet. It's not your toilet. But they okay, wanted sure. to understand it. But how do you visualize a water source underneath the ground? So the way they typically do it is they bring in these big trucks that actually punch the ground. They thump the ground to create seismic waves. And then they study the wave pattern 
as it collides with the whatever is below the surface. Wow, like in Jurassic Park? When did they do that? Jurassic At the beginning, he has a shotgun on that thing, and he shoots the shotgun shell into the ground to make a seismic wave that the computer then gives him a oh, picture of the Velociraptor. That. And then Sam Neill touches it, and it stops working, and, and everybody laughs at him because he's bad at computers. I don't remember yeah. that scene. It's the, it's, the, it's the introduction of Sam Neill and Laura Dern. They actually fire something into the ground. Yeah. Oh. So that's not so different from this. So Yellowstone doesn't want to do that because it's a national park. And they're Fair. all... And you know, basically having machinery just like hammer the ground around Old Faithful didn't work. So they created a much more sensitive rig that studied the seismic patterns of the water just gurgling under the ground. And that would create waves unto itself and was to able to image what's below Old Faithful. Wow, really? And it's this massive porous rock that a huge uh, magma heated um, a pool of water uh, filters through to go up into the geyser. Uh, so the basic conclusion is that there is so much water down there that Old Faithful will uh, last longer than humans, as long as, you know, that mega volcano. So like 2018, out. 2019? <laughs> yeah, Probably. As, as long as that mega volcano doesn't blow. Cool. One other story. The Nobel Prizes were last week. We skipped over them. Uh, it, this is the time of year that, that uh, two things happen. The Nobel Prizes are awarded. They almost always go to older white men. Science journalists get mad because they're like, these prizes are out of date. The rules around them are out of date. And there are lots of think pieces around it. Uh, Ed Young's think piece in The Atlantic on this is, is pretty much spot on uh, in the sense that most of these awards recognize individuals as opposed to the groups that probably conduct the work now. And they also have rules where they don't award Nobel Prizes posthumously. So there's all these great researchers oh. like Vera Rubin, who's an astrophysicist, that will never win the Nobel Prize because of the current rule. And so people are lobbying for the rules to change. All that being said, there was three phenomenal prizes in science that were awarded last week. What, the physics one went to the LIGO team that discovered gravitational waves. By the way, Norm, we have a standing invitation to go up to Hanford to actually Ooh. check out the LIGO instrumentation. I think we'll take up... You did a nice impression of, of the sound of two black holes <laughs> gliding there, too. Um, second, the Biology Medicine Prize went to three researchers that established uh, the circadian rhythm that we all have, the biological clock. That was sort of a surprise win. Most people were expecting something for CRISPR or for immunotherapy. Uh, and then the chemistry one was for something, it's a really cool uh, technique called um, uh, cryo-electron microscopy, where essentially they freeze molecules um, and because they get frozen, they get frozen a certain shape. So they're able to actually understand an image of the different shapes that these molecules take, like proteins and whatnot, um, at a molecular level using this Ooh. technique. And you can get very precise images of how the shapes of these molecules are changing over time. Oh, that's really cool. Do you, have a, do you know how the winners are chosen? Is it like the Academy where everyone who's ever won gets a vote? Yeah, you get a screener of scientific <laughs> papers. <laughs> Those are usually on the internet like three hours after they yeah, ship watermark. out. I know, they're watermarked now, yeah. Um, but uh, there's committees. The committees are um, currently composed of, it's about, uh, there's a gender balance on them uh, now. Many of them are headed um, by women, but there's different committees for each award. Uh, and then there's strict rules, though, that define who can be awarded. Um mm -hmm. And so, so things like that, yeah, researchers have to be alive, et, right. cetera, et cetera, And there's a pretty substantial cash prize, right? It's like a yeah. million bucks? You get a million bucks. It's more than a million bucks now, but yeah. Yeah, but so does that then go, like, do you take that back to your, you know, your graduate assistants and chuck them some cash? Or do you, like, invest that in future research? Or depends on the, do you go buy a couple of Teslas? <laughs> depends on the researcher. It's The million bucks actually isn't the value of it. it. The value of it is partially now you're on, like, the speaker circuit. Right, of course. Uh, and now you're a Nobel laureate, so everyone's throwing cash your way. But also, like, by the time somebody wins a Nobel Prize, they're generally pretty high up in the field anyways. Yeah. Like, I don't think these people need the money Rolling per se. Rolling that fat science cash. Like, they don't, they're not, they're, they're no head of ExxonMobil cash, but, yeah. you know, they're doing fine. Uh, but I think that, like, landing on the circuit where they're constantly invited to give uh, talks and, and given honorariums for that, that's where the real sort of, value windfalls but no like and i think that's part of the absurdity of the award is it's giving money to individuals ligo took maybe a thousand two thousand maybe four thousand scientists to actually yeah. execute uh and it was awarded to three scientists and they were 
they're all very vocal about how it's a group project. But are they the headliners on the pa- on the paper that's awarded? Is that how it works? There are a thousand authors on that first paper, so uh, it, it's not like they're the headliners. It's Kip Thorne, um, Ray Weiss, uh, um, and um, I'm forgetting the third person's name. I'm sorry, but they kind of conceived the project and shepherded the project did, early on. Did, I did a titanium physics episode about LIGO, didn't I? You did on oh, neutrinos. No, I did on neutrinos. The that LIGO was one I listened to before that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going to say really quickly, if you want to learn more about LIGO, my science podcast this week is rerunning a uh, episode with Jan 11 where we talk about the history of that project. It's really, I mean, it's a new form of astronomy. It's really fucking amazing. <laughs> The VR Minute Virtual Reality This Week Hey, it's Oculus Connect Week OC4 is this week It's the big annual uh, Facebook run Oculus a developer conference and Jeremy and I will be there. Will I think you'll also be there. Go tomorrow. Some point. Yeah. Uh, um, so it's Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, don't know about any announcements so far, but hopefully it's always interesting. We, last year we got a demo of their uh, inside out tracking wireless headset that mm-hmm. we haven't seen since then. So ho- in a year's time, hopefully we'll have something in a, to La- check out. Last year was very drama filled. Are you looking for a much more sort of mellow? You know, last year the highlight for me was uh, Echo Arena, which was completely out of nowhere. I didn't mm-hmm. expect that at all. And then, um, you know, there it was. It was just a great demo. And then being software as the big surprise last year, in addition to, you know, getting that hardware demo. And last year, you're, what you're referencing to, of course, was Palmer Lucky was embroiled in some drama, but he's no longer with the company. So hopefully, and this year, uh, I guess... I'd be interested to see how excited developers are this year because the store has been out for a while. Games have been coming out. Of course, there's the Oculus funded stuff, but um, you know, is is there still the same on excitement in for making content for VR? Uh, now, as there was a year ago, two years ago, I think you're inventing drama, Norm. Of course, yeah. there's going to be. VRDC was even hopping this year. There were no, a lot of no, people there. There were a lot of people. No, I don't know about hopping. They they have Oculus has said they have uh, content that they funded that will roll out throughout 2018. So I'm hoping that we get to see the first previews of some of those titles. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, like things we saw earlier this year, whether at GDC or even ahead of the summer of Rift stuff, uh, the Marvel game. So hopefully we'll see yeah. more of that. I'm excited to play. Some I think of that. they live stream the the uh, first keynote, don't they? So people uh, can yes. watch that. So there are two keynotes. Uh, there's going to be an opening keynote that you do every year, and then. Uh, John Carmack is going to do one, I believe, on the second day. I don't think Michael Airbrush is doing one. He had an interesting talk last year. I thought a lot about that since. His talk was his talk is always really interesting. I don't know what he talks about because the last few years he's done talks about the like what, where VR needs to go in the future and kind of yeah. all that stuff hasn't changed a whole lot exactly. in the last year. Exactly, no, so. changed. It's still the early days. Like it's you know yeah. like what what really has changed except that there's a lot more content out on all the platforms. He sat down at my lunch table last year. It was the best we were, thing at the show. We were you were there. there. Yeah. We were there. He doesn't remember us. No, he doesn't remember us. No, so you fine. don't remember us. <laughs> I, I looked. As soon as Abrash sat down, I was laser focused. I was like, okay, let's hear what, what's, what's hey, coming next. I'm really curious, Jeremy. They're, they're Lone Echo is doing a post-mortem. I know. Are you, I hope you go to that. If, if I end up there tomorrow, I will definitely go to that. Yeah, because uh, they, they have uh, learned a lot, I'm sure. And just because, also just the... When we, I think it was a month ago, we talked about some of the personal space issues that were coming up mm-hmm. in Lone Echo, just hearing them talk about some of the, the safety systems they've started to develop and put in place. So I guess if you want to say there is any drama, uh, last year was also the first appearance of Spaces, uh, which is uh, Facebook's social app, which is out now. Um, you know, I, I don't think it has reached its potential, but definitely super interesting social applications. The idea is putting your VR avatar, uh, people uh, interacting in VR with VR avatars uh, with fo- full IK, uh, but transporting themselves into 360 captured environments, 360 video captured environments, uh, or using a, a, um, asymmetrical interactions with people using Facebook Messenger. So they see a portal into your VR world. Right. You see them as a small screen when you're in VR. And my, um, Zuckerberg recently did a NPR uh, live stream where he was in uh, spaces and they were in Puerto Rico. Um, um, they were examining some of the damage uh, that had been caused by the recent hurricanes. And it was a little bit tone deaf. They're cartoony avatars looking yeah. at the, uh, the destruction and then warping back to California. Um, and they've since apologized for that. But No, he didn't apologize. He said he was sorry if people were offended. That's not an apology. Oh, that's the kind of apology wow. we give at home sometimes. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry if I hurt your feelings. Yeah. 
You mean like from a child? Count Sam. Not always. No. <laughs> uh, and then um, other big news on the Steam side. So Valve issued a press release saying that in addition to you know this version 2.0 Lighthouse that they've been working on, uh, all the Steam stuff has been open, open to license. So anyone, any hardware manufacturer with capabilities could take this and make VR headsets and beacons, and now they have access to some lens designs and some manufacturing support. So Valve has new lenses, optical lenses that work with low persistent OLEDs and LCDs, uh, ranging from 85 degrees field of view all the way to 120 degree field of view. Um, very interested to see how this may differ from the hybrid lenses that Oculus are using, or the more Fresnel type lenses that we see in things like your VR or even the uh, or HTC Vive. They said they explicitly said that these lenses are supposed to address um, some uh, uh, screen door and stuff like that. Not right? screen door, but um, the uh, God rays. Oh. So leaking light. Um, you know, we didn't talk about it earlier in the Google stuff, but they did announce a new Google Daydream View at the at the event. Yeah, well, with, what was new about that? So um, the two big things are that they changed the way the face interface works so that it's, it, it closes, seals out better, and it's more comfortable. As opposed to just being like a pantry door? Huh. Well, on the one that you have, no, no, not on the front. I mean, on the where it, oh, where the it touches seal. your face. Okay, got it, the gasket. It's pretty. It's hard, and it, if your face doesn't match it up perfectly, then you'll get light bleed through from the back edges and under your nose. Um, also, and, there's cooling, some passive cooling. Yeah, so they put a big chunk of magnesium in the front flap hmm. that hits the back of the new phones exactly where they get hot, so they can dissipate heat a lot faster. So you shouldn't overheat as much. Yeah, and um, it still works with the old phones. It does work with the old phones, and they they uh, they updated their lenses too. So they used machine learning. They said to improve the sweet spot in the lenses or something like that, and hmm. and make it work with more because there's no IPD adjustments. So they need they need to tweak the way the the lenses work a little bit because From of that. From what I've understand, I don't know if this is a hard definition, but this there when we say sweet spot for lenses, we're talking about uh, where your eyes are relative to how big the lenses are, yeah. and. Um, Sometimes it feels like when there is a smaller sweet spot, you get, you can avoid some of the visual artifacts. But larger sweet spot comes with the visual artifacts because your eyes can move across the lenses. Yes, as they move. As, as they move. Um, well, because they have to count for more different types of eyes. Yes, like play, eye play. Like if you look at my eye placement, Norm's eye placement, your eye placement. There, the depth in from the, like the, the your cheekbone back to where your front of your eye is. Yeah. This width, the height, all of that stuff is different. But you, you have the problem of people with different IPDs. Yeah. So is the, some type of is the best solution ordering your shoe size, but in your VR headset? I don't think that will work given That's the size of the work, today's yeah. market. Or what they hope to be a future market. Yeah. Like you, even three sizes, three distances. Imagine don't if you work. had to buy an iPhone based on the size of your hand. Oh, wait. And the screen you want. Yeah. So, uh, and I guess uh, the last thing is, let's talk about Windows Mixed Reality, because we haven't talked about it in the podcast. There was an oh. um, announcement event, so it's actually coming out next week? One week. One from. week. The 17th uh, is the launch of Windows Mixed Reality. This is just their VR headsets. Some of those use, you know, low persistent LCDs. Uh, the one that we're super interested in, it seems like a lot of people out there are interested in, is the Samsung Odyssey with a little bit wider field of view, <laughs> 105 degrees, uh, as w 110 degrees? As uh, well the as, Odyssey is 110, yeah. Yeah, 110 as well as um, high-resolution uh, OLED panel. Um, and I think the the trade-offs for tracking yet to be seen. Um, the, all of them have inside-out tracking. So they have what they call um, um, Microsoft uh, Surface right, technology. But we don't know quite how much it is. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, obviously HoloLens. But we don't know quite how much of that HoloLens technology is actually being used. Right. What, right. what I will say is from using those headsets is they work exceedingly well. So they, they do. Right, but there are a lot of experiences, and people point out like games like Onward or even, um, uh, I guess, less so much Space Pirate Trainer, but games where you're supposed to be focusing your attention and your, your head, um, your gaze in a certain direction, but grabbing things in your body. You know, behind your body. In Onward Military Tactical Shooter, you put things on your belt, oh, right, on right, your right. body, and you don't look at that. And sometimes you can expand the hitbox to make those You're things grabbable. You're talking about the hands losing track of the, uh, the headset losing track of the hands because the That's only right. way that the hands are tracked is when they're in the field of view in front of the camera. Yes, field of view, which uh, yeah. the camera field of view, which is wider than your visual field yeah. of view. 
pretty uh, substantially wider from what I was able to tell. It's yeah. not substantial. It's like well, right right after they leave your field of view, that's when they'll lose tracking. Right. So, but you'll never see them lose tracking. So the thing that I found, um, I tested the, the Acer and the HP headset at VRDC a few weeks ago. Yeah. And um, the on the HP especially, it was notable because they would pop in in the top of my field of view. That was the only place I could get it to a point that it would be out of tracking where you could I, still see it. I could still see it. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the point is some games are you're actually holding your hand behind you. You know, yeah. yeah. Grabbing space, a shield. Space Pride Trainer, you're holding a shield to avoid that stuff's being easy to cheat, though. It, it like, is. It's, totally. it, like if you're doing tilt brush, it's going to make it a like you can't do a big sweeping movement with tilt brush, if, right? Unless you're looking at it. Unless you're looking at yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But you could, but with the Space Pirate Trainer, if your hand, like the accelerometer and the gyroscope are accurate enough to know that you've dropped your hand three feet, so you're probably picking up your other gun or switching to, to your shield behind in, your in back. In my experience, or whatever. they don't do any positional when, when it's out of your field of view. It just does rotational no. and, it, oh, and, really? and it does the, the buttons. Oh, so it doesn't track linear movement right. after you've moved. Right. No positional. Oh, that's weird. Uh, I mean, you know, because it, they can't be accurate about it. But we don't yet. I mean, the games that they sell on their actual store inside of the the Cliff House, which is this whole thing that they've developed for Windows Mixed Reality. It's like a version of Windows that is spatial. Mm-hmm. Um, for all of those games, I'm sure that they're going to work fine. Space Pirate Trainer is one of them. Yeah. Uh, they, it's they still work, in development. They work still. well enough. Uh, yeah. But there are probably games like Onward and other games where you'll question whether or not it's as good as an actual direct hand controller. And Microsoft wants people to, wants developers to adapt their software, um, in, whether it's in Unity or Unreal, to be in the Microsoft Store, in which case you will make those concessions, you will expand your grab boxes, um, your detection boxes, but if you have native Steam VR support, then those developers aren't supposed to do anything, and it might make for a worse experience in some yeah. cases. Well, so with, the, with native Steam VR support supporting, right now it supports two platforms, with Oculus and Vive. And we'll soon right. support and soon Microsoft. Yeah, developers Microsoft. now have access to the, those SDKs, and they plan to launch for consumers before the holiday. Yeah, like it's pretty straightforward. The, like the Steam VR support is pretty straightforward. It's um, gotten a lot better over I, the last six months. I mean, the, the, as good as the inside-out tracking is, I mean, it, it actually is very, very surprisingly good. You can take the headset and move it around the the room, and it's constantly tracked. Well, you can move it, the cameras right up to the floor, and mm-hmm. it continues to be tracked spatially. I'm I'm really quite impressed with that, and. The fact that there's very little setup for the, you know, when you open the box and you get your headset on, you don't have to set up your sensors or cameras, yeah. plug them in, get the USB jacks. It just, it works right inside the headset and it potentially is a more uh, limitless boundary. Do you have to aim it like around the room so it learns the room before you put it on or anything? Or do you know yet? We have it run through the setup process, okay. but they say you can, yeah, you, you, you can figure out. There will be some memory. I, I'm probably going to buy one of those, frankly, just to do demos when I'm away so I don't have yeah. to take light sands with that's, me everywhere and, I and go. And that's the thing. We're moving closer and closer toward the uh, finding these trade-offs, but convenience of travel and portability yeah. is a huge selling point. So I think we, and we did an AMA yesterday uh, with Ben from Road to VR where uh, someone asked, you know, what, what do you think is going to be tracking the future? And even though the best tracking right now may be something like the Lighthouse, you know, version two system, you get the biggest volume and least chance for occlusion. Um, it's going to be a tough sell when if on the other side you could have something maybe that's the equivalent of processing power and visual fidelity of a Gear VR, but you still have sixed off because of inside-out tracking, and they can use it in any room in your house or put it in your backpack and take it in a hotel room. I, I mean, I really – like this VR is going to remain something for people like us until we get to the point where we have a standalone device that does inside-out tracking with hands. Yeah. With hand, like you it mean, has to have you mean hands. some type of um, leap motion style hand tracking? No, I mean hand analogs. Controllers are fine. You don't you don't th- think with like leap motion style? The if leap motion. I mean, tracking? if it's we're, it, it's a long time before we see leap motion that's good enough. I think for everything, but, buttons, but, buttons are important. Buttons yeah. are important. I need, I need buttons and haptic feedback. Tricks, of some yeah. triggers, yeah. pads, even whatever. Fact, in, even uh, active feedback. The fact that you're put depressing a Pushing, trigger. Yeah. Most an of analog the things button. we need a tool analog. Uh, so I, I don't know, I'm excited about Windows Mixed Reality. It's just the fact that we have another big hardware vendor jumping into the space is a good thing for VR in general. Oh, it's the, cheap. The resolution is, is good. The resolution already out of the box, the base level is higher than what you're going to get on the other big headsets. And also, if, if you're playing Sims, like mm-hmm. Sim Sim gamers who are already investing hundreds of dollars on wheels and and eye trackers and and seats, you know, four hundred, five hundred dollars. Actually, they would probably won't even need the controllers. But four hundred dollars for a headset that they can play, uh, you know, Project Cars in yeah. in their seat 
is going to be extremely compelling. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. The the controllers on on that they don't feel quite as good as the Rift controllers or or probably even the 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 Vive Touch. I'm sorry, yeah. the Vive ones. Yeah. But they're good enough. All right, let's move on to our last segment. What have we been testing this week? Hey, what have you guys been testing? Not the air conditioner. Man, it's hot in here. Oh, all right. Uh, took the essential phone to New York Comic Con. Um, is it essential? Well, having a phone is absolutely essential. Okay. One, it just reminds me how much I hate the battery life on the iPhone like 6S. Yeah. But that alone. I mean, it's a new phone. This is the toughest thing. But you're a success? Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's tough when using a new phone because the battery is going to be the best it's always going to be. But still, the battery life on this thing is pretty great. Yeah. I really like that. Did not find... So there are two, two uh, noticeable features um, in terms of display. One, you get a lot more display at the top because it has almost edge to edge, but there's the notch. Mm-hmm. And then for, two, the, for the camera. For the camera. And two, there's chin. There's still chin on the bottom. Chin didn't bug me at all. My hand is covering that. I did not need to have the extra space in the bottom. At the same time, having the extra space at the top really didn't benefit for a lot of things because it's still a status bar. It's not... A, like, photos, yes, but... For the vast majority of, of programs, it's... Well, for anything that hides the status bar, you gain nothing. Yeah. But and a for lot apps of programs, that, that still have it as a status bar. Yeah. What if you watch a movie? Does it have the little notch cut out? Uh, if you watch a movie, it does. It, it puts black bars. Like, I can show you yeah. YouTube. But, you know, it also reminds me of all the things I liked about Andro- I like about Android mm-hmm. um, and its customization the notifications be- being able to do so much in the notification bar uh, but the scrolling is still slow there's still something about the scrolling I've that is always just hated a that. little bit I mean no, how, however much butter you put into it it's yeah. just a little bit slower the thing one of the things I've noticed on the pixel is that every few days I find I want to reboot the whole phone. Just because it feels chunky. No, but what he's yeah. talking about is something I, no, no, I know. inherent. But that that's that's pronounced. Like you get that gets worse the longer you run the phone, I, it seems like, at I, least for me. I also feel like when Oreo came out, it was worse. It was a setback for that. Is Oreo the current one? Yeah. That's the Android eight stock that's on Essential. So I would wait for some patches that might help with that a little bit. But yeah, like I just hit my thing, I felt the bump that said, Hey, you're on, and then it took two seconds for the screen to turn what, on. What about the camera on it? Sucks. It's it not just like it, sucks or is bad compared to the Pixel XL and the iPhone so 7. So image quality wise, I think it's okay. Okay. It's about the experience. It's a slow camera. You mean like less shutter lag? Shutter lag, app launch lag, mm. um, f- uh, f- frame rate on the display. Uh, they just need to improve the software on the camera. Oh, that sucks. Uh, and um, the, the last thing is uh, scaling in Android. So it's a very high resolution display. Apple has scaling locked down, right? On on the normal size phones, it's like a like one like x scaling. On their plus phones, it's two x with some down sampling. On the new phone, it's going to be a three point. You're talking about like the the rendering versus the pixel. Here, it's kind of variable. So there's an inconsistency that I just don't like between how dense text is on a website versus in some in apps. I mean, okay. Just minor inconsistencies. That's Android. That's Android. Yeah. That's Android. Yeah. Um, what about you guys? Well, I guess I could finally talk about my 3D printer. You did know, you get a new 3D printer? You remember when you used to care about 3D printers, Will Smith? Yeah. You used to do the 3D printer of the week. That was a long time ago. <laughs> that was exciting. Yeah. People, you should do that. It's a good, good series. People ask me about it all the time. They're like, hey, Will, when do you bring back the MakerBot mystery build? Do they I'm do like, I don't work there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey yeah. Will, can you tell Norm to move the microphone out of the way of his face on Stella Title? Nope, I don't work there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You're still on that podcast, Once. though. You could literally reach your hand across the table yeah. and do it. Yeah. Hey, Will, I've noticed you haven't been on videos that much lately. Yep. No shit. <laughs> well, you, you can't ever leave. Uh, you got a Prusa... Uh, Mark II. Uh, I3, I3 Mark II. Yeah, I3 Mark II. S. S. Yeah, because uh, so my printer Such bot, good... it, it finally died. Like, I had it for two and a half years, and it was PrinterBot Plus, and I was just, it was on life support. How much uh, filament did you run through that thing? The printer bot? Yeah. Oh, I couldn't tell you. Pounds? Kilograms? Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? 
Like just like reams constantly. Yeah. Well, I mean, over the over the years. Okay. Because I used it to develop the, the game frame uh, re- Redux and the, all okay. kinds of stuff. I, just, I want the word reams to be replaced like heaps, like <laughs> heaps of things. Reams, reams is paper. I know. I don't know okay. about you, but my kids they sometimes use three D printing as a rainy day activity. Not we, that we have enough we rainy that. days here. Yeah, but we we've done that before. That's a, that, that's an exercise in patience. Well, the, the choosing is the fun part, and then you print it, you get it later. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. any case. Uh, the printer bot, uh, I'm very un- unhappy with their level of support um, it, towards the end. I just wasn't hearing from them, and uh, the, the the printer just had issues. So, upgrade. I finally bought one. A lot of good reviews for the Prusa i3. Thought I'd take a shot. Uh, it was $700 for the kit. So I wow. built it, which was a day, actually a day and a half. It was That's a, pretty fast. It was, a, well, it was a major build. Like, I was kind of shocked. Loved the build process, though. Once it was over, I really know the printer now. Man, does it print good. Holy Fast. cow. Holy cow. Is that what you printed no. that thing that you showed us before on? Yes. Nice. Now, it, now it doesn't print extremely fast. It's it's uh, not actually terribly fast. Maybe it maxes out about 100 milliseconds. Uh, what is it? A second? Uh, uh, right? Meters per second. Is it, it can't be meters. 100 meters? No, no, no. It can't be that. In any case, Millimeters per second. whatever that setting is. Yeah. Slow? <laughs> it's like half half the Ultimaker speed, right? So it's not fast. That's pretty good, though. But we talked last week or two weeks ago that how they announced the MK3. Um, and that is twice as fast, so that's now super fast. Okay. If you want the fast one, get the new one. Uh, they they didn't the announce one. that one before I bought this, so it was, it was kind of surprising. But in any case, love it. Um, I'm very happy with it. The heated bed is, has, is, has um, you, Is this PI. your first heated bed? Yeah, it was PEI. PEI. It's, it's, service. it's awesome. I mean, yeah. things stick to it, and then when it cools down, they just fall right off. It's, oh, that's the best. It's the best. Like, there's very little chiseling. Um, it's, it heats up very quickly. It's quiet. Uh huh. And uh, how it, accurate are the prints? Like when you put a caliper on them, are they the right size? Yeah, they're the right size. Okay. And I mean, and I couldn't do like even 0.1 millimeter layer height before. I had yeah. to do 0.2. I've done 0.05 layer. Oh, and Ooh, it's God. just like you can't even gratuitous. see it. You can't even Ooh. see it. It's fantastic. Love this printer. So highly recommended, uh, especially the new one coming out next month. Presumably. Uh, that's what they say. They're going to start shipping to. And I mean, presumably it's better. You don't know. You haven't tested it. No, that's that's true. That's true. But, but the specs. I, account, I mean, dude, oh. the specs are awesome. I love spec sheets. It's got. They can actually get get feedback now from the stepper motors, so they actually know if they lose steps. Oh, that's so nice. If it hits something, or if there's la- if there's some sort of skipping, it can account for that, real time. And stepper do it. motors. There's also a laser that sees if the filament runs out, so it'll stop your print, and then you can take over from that Is point. Is there a thing that tells you when you're printing spaghetti? When you've like lost adhesion to the layer below, and it's just like blasting everywhere, and nope. the thing pops off the the, the bed. Nope, it's Those still are 3D, my favorite. It's still three D printing. Okay. Yeah. All I, right. Yeah. I think that does it for uh, for this week's podcast. Uh, one last random story. You know how we always talk about baller checking. Yeah. You know the biggest baller checking is, Oprah is baller checking. She went to a bank this week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And deposited a two million dollar check. Okay. What? I just wanted to put that story out. Why are we talking about that? Did Can, she do it from the ATM or did she go up to the <laughs> teller? You gotta go to the teller for that one. <laughs> in, sure. in cash. Can we talk about can we talk about toilet names for a sec? There's two naming strategies for toilets, for like branding for toilets. One is that it should be a serene, peaceful place. Mm-hmm. Sure. The other is that it should it, it implies power. power and capability. Yeah. <laughs> so you you have max like the, the the power max <laughs> vortex. Mm-hmm. Versus, <laughs> oh god, what was mine? What's mine? What's the one I got called? The uh, the the Eliminator three thousand or something. <laughs> I'm disappointed you didn't get the four thousand dollar toilet from Home Depot. Look, I'm not in a a. I'm not going to live in this house for long enough to get my money is worth out of a four thousand dollar toilet. <laughs> it's going to be the you best shit ever. You make your money back in the second use. B, <laughs> fuck. I like I. My car probably isn't worth four thousand dollars right now. All right. Yeah. Do you have a squatty potty by any chance? No. Oh, I love the squatty potty. <laughs> I, oh, no. I don't want to think about squatty potties. You got to watch the video. When I was at Adult Swim, this. they had a squatty, squatty potty. Yeah. I tried it. It felt un- uh, unnecessary. Really? Yeah. Well, maybe you're, I like well, it. It you're takes well balanced. You, it I have a lot you, of fiber in my diet. It takes usually about five squatties before you get the squatty potty. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I will. Uh, one thing I wanted to note is if there's any, uh, this is only a test listeners, they're living up in the North Bay uh, where oh, yeah. the wildfires are raging, we've all had a lot of uh, friends and family members uh, affected by the fires. Hopefully, you stay safe and uh, recover from it. I know the winds are picking up tonight. Yeah. Good luck to our friends. 
All right. And, and, and evacuate when they tell you to leave. And yeah. don't fly your fucking drones near the wildfires. That's a bad idea. Sorry. Uh, do we have an outro this week? I'm sure we do. Hey, and- uh, I, my thing's on Adult Swim. Oh, yes. Uh, you can check out. So, Will, uh, P- pigskin prognostications from the Something Wizard is on Adult Swim every Wednesday. It's adultswim.com every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Okay. Um, it's offensive and has an adult language, so don't watch it with your kids around. It's also on uh, demand after you watch it on their website. And uh, a new episode of The Foo Show is coming very soon. Ooh. Foofy.com. Total War.com, uh, Total War Warhammer 2. That's very cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's a impromptu outro. Or, or short. Oh, wait. I have one thing to promo. <laughs> the craziest event I've ever put on is happening in a couple weeks. I'm doing something called Science Slam, which is a team up of an amateur wrestling night <gasps> featuring people playing historical acting figure, uh, scientific characters. So we're having Rosalind Franklin wrestle Watson and Crick. Did you get the Hood Slam people to do this? Yeah, Hood Slam's doing it. Nice. Tesla Edison. You're trying to make that list again, aren't you? Tyson Nye. That's going to go over well. Wow. And some like real special surprises. All right. <laughs> I got the Cimarron. And uh, you can find all of our stuff on tested.com. Oh. Uh, until then, we'll see you next time. Hey, can we talk about toilet names for a second? I got the Cimarron. Max Flush. Test it. Test it. Test it. We'll see you next time.